A quick caveat here at the beginning, I am not really a drugstore queen. In fact, it's an understatement to say that I'm not really a drugstore queen. I've tried a lot of makeup in my day, and the vast majority majority of it has been high-end. So I have had not as broad a sampling of drugstore products as a lot of people who are here on YouTube, and I'm just letting you know that my list has derived from a smaller sampling than maybe many of you have had and then a lot of people on YouTube have had. At the same time, because I have a preference for high-end makeup and I've tried much more high-end stuff and even some luxury stuff, a drugstore product has to be really, really good to impress me. The first product on my list is the CoverGirl Clean Fresh Cream Blush, which I absolutely love saying. Clean Fresh Cream Blush, it just rolls off the tongue, but it's also kind of a tongue twister. I live. These Blushes were given to me by my friend Lauren, Lauren May Beauty. I feel like I talk about her in every video these days. She received the entire Clean Fresh line twice over because I think she got it at the launch party and then she also got it sent in PR. So she gave me all four of these blush colors. Two of them are more pink. One's like a berry pink and one's a bright pink. I knew that I wouldn't like those colors, so I just gave them away untouched and unopened. And then I had these two, Flushed, which is a really brilliant coral red. I had nothing like this, and definitely nothing like this in the cream blush department. So I decided to open this and try it. I decided to give away this one, Butterflies, which is like a slightly pinkish nude, like a deeper brownie pinkish nude. I knew that I would love the color, but I have other cream blushes in this color. So I was like, you know, I'll just keep the one that's a total standout in my collection. But I fell so in love with this formula that I pulled it out of my giveaway box and I decided to open it and try it. Then I fell in love with it too, so I actually decided to keep both of them. It layers so beautifully. It blends into the skin so beautifully. Many people who have reviewed this have said that they don't like that it's metallic because when you squeeze out the little dollop, you can see the, the metallic pigment, the reflective pigment in that intensified dollop when you squeeze it out. And then it's like, why? I remember people reviewing it and being like, why did they do that? Why didn't they just make a straight matte pigment in their cream blush and then people could highlight with whatever they wanted? But I love that quality and I find that even though it's a little scary when you see how metallic it looks like on the back of the hand, when it blends out, it just blends out to look beautifully sheeny, almost like a very skin-like sheen. When I wear only this, it looks like I've mixed it with a liquid highlighter. It looks really gorgeous, but it also looks like a very skin-like natural highlighter, not like a metallic stripe or a see it from space type of highlighter. And there have been times when I've been editing my own footage where I was wearing this and I was like, oh my gosh, what highlighter did I mix with that? It looks so stunning. And then I remembered that I hadn't mixed it with a highlighter. It's just the way it looks. It looks very dewy. I think that it's pretty extraordinary that it has that quality and that it's also very blendable and buildable, doesn't get patchy, doesn't cling, and is being sold at the low, low drugstore price of I think something like $10. It might be less than that. I just feel like the quality outperforms a lot of high-end formulas of this type. I've been incredibly impressed by this. I would have included them on this list in any case, but I'm particularly eager to include them on this list because I know that this product got mixed reviews. So I just want to throw my hat in the ring and be like, it's not a mixed review for me, friends. It's an A+. Let's talk about another drugstore blush that's pretty much the total opposite of those because it's not a cream blush, it's a powder blush, and I've had it for way, way longer. I have had this since before my no-buy year, which means I've had it since before I started my YouTube channel, and I forgot to include it in the video about the makeup that I've had since before I started my YouTube channel because I have depotted it and turned it into a single. This is the iconic, the famous apricot in the middle. It's a wet n wild powder blush. It's one of their color icon blushes and they aren't easy to depot. I, I had this before my no by year and I had another one. I think I had mellow wine. This one went beautifully. I think it was very hot in my old apartment on that day and so the glue had softened. I was able to pop it out without cracking it. Mellow wine was completely destroyed when I tried to depot it and I, I threw it away. There was nothing for it. There, it was just, there was no salvaging it. It just turned to dust. It cracked when I tried to get the pan out and then it just 
devolved from there. That's just to say that in spite of this example of depotting, take care. These are the magnets that I stuck on the back. Take care if you decide to depot a blush like this. I would actually recommend warming the glue up by putting it in the oven for a little while, putting it on a radiator, a heater, using a hairdryer, something like that. Anyway, it's in amongst my singles. When I was filming that video about the makeup I've had since before my know-by year, I forgot to go through my singles and I forgot to reference them in the video, but if I hadn't forgotten then this would definitely have been in it. As you can see, I have significant pan on this. There were many, many years there during which this was my product of choice for the cheeks when traveling. Because it is now a single and it's magnetic, I can put it in a, a magnetic pan along with singles that are magnetic and create sort of like a custom travel palette. And I went to several tango festivals back in the day with this as my only cheek product. I would bring this and not even bring a highlighter because it's a slightly glimmery blush and it looks really beautiful in low light. And a lot of times when I'm putting on makeup for tango, that's what I'm putting on makeup for. So it adds that soft wash of shimmery apricot-y color it also gives that gleam, that like highlighted gleam, looks beautiful also on the nose. It's also soft enough that I could even kind of bronze my neck up with it a little bit, a little bit maybe on the chin. We have drifted apart, I think since the last time, I think I did take it with me the last time I traveled to a festival of that kind where I was just like really intentionally putting together a kit of makeup to take with me. And since then, I haven't used it and it has kind of fallen out of my memory, like case in point, I forgot to put it in that video, I just forgot about it. There have even been some other videos where I was inventorying my blushes, talking about all my blushes and I forgot to talk about the couple of blushes that I have that are in magnetic pans. So I haven't been spending very much time with it and I recently pulled it back out and used it again because I was like, oh yeah, apricot in the middle, my old friend. And I was interested to find that I didn't love it as much as I used to love it. And that's because the shimmer in it is patently gold. And as I've tried more and more makeup and I've spent more time doing my makeup, more makeup playtime, my tastes have also evolved. But I think it's more to the point of I've learned more about the spectrum of different kinds of makeup. I think back when this was like my favorite blush of all time, I wasn't a person who really made much of a distinction between like a gold shimmer running through a blush and a more champagne shimmer or a silver shimmer. Now when I apply it, I'm like, whoa, it's a gold shimmer blush. And I've learned that gold doesn't necessarily flatter me as well as other kinds of shimmer because I'm so very, very pale. That's not to say that it's not wonderful. I think one of the best things about this blush is the actual mill of the powder, like the fineness of the powder, the way that it disperses, how easy it is to apply, how difficult it is to mess up like it's just flawless all the time so I don't think that it's not as good of a product as I did before I think the wet n wild blushes are one of the best products at the drugstore that I've tried and that's why it's making it into this video some of the best most impressive blow me away drugstore products that I've tried just in this past year have been the lash products from Milani why are these products not more hyped? I don't understand what's going on. I don't have the mascara with me, the Milani Highly Rated Mascara. It's the one that has little gold stars all over it because I used it up and it, and it was an empty, so I recycled the container. But that is the most impressive drugstore mascara that I've ever tried. I don't understand why L'Oreal Lash Paradise got so much hype when Milani Highly Rated already existed. I just don't get it. I think it's fantastic and I think that it does everything that Lash Paradise claims to do but more reliably and more dramatically. It was just a really, it was to me, that's the dupe for better than sex at the drugstore. Milani highly rated. I, I can't explain better what it does for the lashes than to say that to me it's a dupe for better than sex. It's just, it has that big fluffy brush and it does that thing where you start putting on and you feel like your lashes are instantly enhanced. And then you can keep building it for like a really thick, goopy, spidery look if that's what you want. Like me. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? <laughs> but you don't have to do that. You can stick with that sort of fluffy, almost like dry, wispy, powdery volume. I was so impressed by that mascara and I was really sad when I used it up. And then I moved on to other mascaras, but I dug the Mil Milani lash primer called the violet one out of my backups box it had been in my backups box for ages and i was just like whatever because i don't tend to get along well with lash primers i find that what happens is that i'll put them on my lashes and even though they might add volume and add length they cause the lashes to preemptively stick together 
And then when I go back in with my other mascara, which is almost always some sort of lengthening, volumizing mascara, it's like it negated because the volumizing mascara itself doesn't have individual lashes to build on and stick to because they've all been clumped together by the primer. This, however, possibly stays a little bit wetter longer and also is a bit more flexible and soft. It doesn't turn into like a super crunchy hold. And I find that when I go in with other mascaras on top of it, it will kind of like work with them. And it's also really volumizing and really lengthening. So I've been able to get better looking lashes, more intense looking lashes with this underneath the Gucci mascara, for example, that I really love, and the Aaron Faces mascara that I really love, then I'm able to get when I use those mascaras alone. So that's three, and of the three that are left, two of them are lip products. So I'll knock the other one out first, and then I'll talk about the two lip products that are on my list. The other one is ColourPop Easy Breezy Brow, which I have had for a long time, but I just had it in my empties video, and then I recycled the container. So I don't have it to show you, but it looks like any old brow enhancing pomade, I guess is what they're called. So it's very similar in every way to Glossier Boy Brow in terms of like the shape of the container, the way the little brush looks, the way that it applies. The difference for me is that Boy Brow doesn't hold my brows up. It'll look really good when I first put it on. It adds that nice layer of darkening pomade wax. It brushes them up. They look beautiful. They look fluffy. They look full. And then my stubborn brows will just fall back into place. They fall like a souffle if they're not being held in place by something strong, waxy and strong. And boy brow just isn't strong enough. It doesn't set. Enter CoverGirl Easy Breezy Brow. That's why I love it because it feels soft and waxy, but it's very, very firm when it sets. And I also find that I can get it all over my brows, get them to be coated with it and looking fluffy and looking darkened with the product. And then I can go back in later after it set, sometimes hours later with a spoolie and kind of fool around with them and like comb them and push them back into place. And I can even do that thing where I press them down onto my skin and like paste to them onto my skin. That's what I tend to do with the Patrick Ta. I find that the CoverGirl Easy Breezy Brow is kind of like that, but in a tube. It's not quite as versatile and powerful as the one from Patrick Ta, but it's good enough for me to be loyal to it and to believe that it deserves a place on this list. All right, let's talk about the lip products that are the best I've ever tried from the drugstore. One is a lipstick and one is a lip gloss. And if you know me, then you have probably already guessed at least one, if not both of them. The one that's maybe the most obvious, it's the Maybelline lipsticks. They're just so good. And I brought one of each. I have three Maybelline lipsticks. Two of them are the matte formula, the, uh, yeah, just Maybelline mattes. And the other is the bold or the audacious, audacieux. It has it in the French. Bold slash audacieux. Maybe it's audacieux. I bet that's what it is. Anyway, these are my two favorite. Two of my like favorite lipsticks of life, my entire life, Maybelline Raw Chocolate and Maybelline Gone Grage. The colors obviously contribute to them being my favorites or them being some of the best products I've ever found at the drugstore, but it's the formula that I want to talk about because the formula is incredibly good. It's really, really nice and creamy, but it's still very matte looking. It doesn't feel matte on the lips. I prefer this lipstick formula to almost any matte lipstick formula I've ever tried. The smell, it's like a very light vanilla latte smell. To me, it definitely smells like some sort of coffee drink, like a sweet vanilla cappuccino or vanilla coffee drink, or maybe like fake vanilla syrup that goes into coffee. I don't hate it, but the smell's probably my least favorite thing about these. I feel like the color range is just very sophisticated of both of these, the Maybelline mattes and the Maybelline Audacia, the bolds. I just think that this is like a true gem of the drugstore. Maybelline re really hits it out of the park with their bullet lipsticks. And then the last one is a gloss that has really impressed me. This is the Revlon Super Lustrous, the gloss. I have it in two colors and I like this one better, the one called Blissed Out. It's like a, it, it doesn't look in the tube like it would be something I like because it looks pink with a gold flip, which is just not my jam for any cosmetics. But on the lips, it just like deepens 
my lips and makes them makes them look really juicy and also makes them look more shiny. And then the other color that I have is Indulge in it, which is a deep, almost berry color. Again, in the tube, I'm always kind of like, mm, maybe I can declutter it. Maybe I only need to keep the one that I like the best. But then when I apply it onto my lips, it's like this deep, juicy my lips but better and I can never bring myself to get rid of it. I feel like this is Charlotte Tilbury Bond Girl in a gloss. It gives my lips that same kind of bitten look. The thing again though that's amazing about these, the colors are great but the colors, you know, you can find good colors in a lot of places. The thing that's amazing is the formula. It goes on almost like an oil. It doesn't feel oily. It's just, you know, how an oil goes on pretty thin. It feels like a very thin layer of something and it feels very slippy when you rub your lips together. It slips on itself rather than sticking. It's not gooey in the least. It is truly like a glaze, like a very, very thin oily glaze, super comfortable, and yet it's much more tenacious than other thin feeling and slippy feeling lip products that I've tried. And also the colors are rich. The smell of these isn't the greatest, it's a little bit chemically. If anything, it's like a sweet, sweet vanilla or sweet candy smell that's trying to mask that chemical smell. I'm really, really glad that they didn't try to mask it with a fruit smell because I really can't, there's something I really can't stand about that, like a chemical smelling drugstore lip product that has like a fruit overlay to it sort of grosses me out. If there's just a slight bit of sweet vanilla introduced to it to try to balance it out, then I can handle that. I don't think about the smell of these when I'm applying it and I don't remember it. Like I didn't remember it at all and I had to smell it to try to remember. So it's definitely not intrusive enough to disturb the experience of wearing them. Basically, they look absolutely beautiful. They feel beautiful to wear. I find them pleasant to apply and distinctive and they're some of the best lip glosses I've ever tried. So that's why they're making it into this video because they also happen to be from the drugstore. I am here to tell you what my experience has been with the products that I hauled from Ulta. So we're gonna do like a countdown from the one that excites me the least to the products that were in this haul that excite me the most and that I'm the most excited that I decided to test. Nothing in this haul has really just been like awful. And that's probably because I was taking recommendations from my patrons, from people who know my tastes and also are very familiar with makeup themselves and they were saying that these things are tried and true for them. And I will explain to you why the things that are at the bottom are at the bottom. In some cases it's for specific reasons that have to do with color and that have to do with my tastes and not necessarily for reasons of like performance or formula and not necessarily reasons that would apply to you. What I'm trying to say is that I ordered these from the ones that excite me the least to the ones that excite me the most just based on the Sparks Joy principle for me. I didn't try to like assess them objectively. I'm just literally telling you which of these things I personally am the least excited to have and then going through to the ones that I personally am the most excited to have. And that's just gonna be the vehicle for my reviews. Oh my gosh, let's actually start it. Okay, the one at the very bottom is the Revlon Super Lustrous Glass Shine Lipstick. This is a new product and I got it because some of you requested, there were a couple of you who requested specifically to know about this lipstick. So Kate specifically wanted to know if this was maybe a dupe for Gucci's Goldie Red. And you'll be able to see that they aren't exactly the same color. Goldie Red, the Gucci lip wall that I really, really love, is a bit dirtier. It's got a little bit of ruddy quality to it. Um, in fact, it's cl closer in color to Velvet Dragon, the Lisa Eldridge lipstick that I recently purchased, than it is to Glaring Red by um, Revlon. However, the formula of this, the Revlon Super Lustrous, is wonderful. And this is at the very bottom of the pile, not at all because of the formula, but because I am going to give this away to someone who enjoys a more cool toned red rather than keeping it and wearing it myself because I don't really like cool toned reds. It's just not my tastes when it comes to red. And I do have one or two that lean a little bit more cool toned like Glossier Driver. And I'll definitely reach for Driver instead of this because this is like, it's like a bright solid mid cool tone, like a, like a cherry, like a cool toned cherry red. And I feel like if I ever am gonna dabble in cool toned reds, it's those ones that lean a little bit more burgundy that are just a little bit more brown, a little bit more grungy. So I'm happy to give this away because it's a great product and I know that 
for some people, it's going to be the perfect product. If I had a different taste in colors, it might actually be at the very, very top because the formula is fantastic. The other thing that disgruntled me about this is that I really struggled to get the sticker off and then I used nail polish remover and it messed up the bullet. So it's the bullet is marred. I do think that the packaging is incredibly beautiful. It's very impressive, but the sticker issue is an issue. Many of you said in the comments on that video that I should use Goo Gone, which we might have somewhere in the house, but I, I didn't look for it. I was able to get it all off with micellar water and a little bit of cleansing oil. So, you know, in the future, if I do buy, I, this lipstick is funny, it's at the very bottom for me, this color, this one, but of everything that I have been testing from the drugstore, this is one of the products that I feel interested in buying in other colors. That's how much I like the formula. So that should tell you something about everything else because this is at the very bottom, but I kind of want to try it in a, a, a coral. They have a glaring coral and there's also one called Nude Illuminator. I'm interested. I'm following its future career in my life <laughs> with great interest. I feel like that was a little strained. Moving on. Okay, sort of a disappointment. The fact that this next product is the second to the bottom. It's the one that I'm the second least excited about for me personally of everything that I hauled. And it's something that I think I'm probably, well, I was about to say that I'm going to end up giving it away, but I'm not totally sure about that. It's these, the Essence um, Melted Chrome Eyeshadows. So the reason that it's disappointing is that if you watched that first video, the haul video, when I was opening these things on camera and swatching them for the first time, you'll remember that I was, oh, I was blown away by these. The color, the pigment, they just, the swatches are beautiful and you'll see it in the overhead. And you know what these are? I've, I have realized over the past 10 days with them, they're super shock shadows. It's the drugstore dupe for the super shock shadow. There's, it's literally exactly the same. If you took this out of its pan and you put it on the table, just the, the substance, which you could do very easily because it does kind of want to jump out because it's like that soft putty, just like a super shock. If you took it out and put it, and then you took the, in, the innards out of a super shock shadow and put it on the table, and you told me to like swatch them and tell you which one was the super shock and which one was the essence melted chrome eyeshadow, I would fail the test. Like they are super shock shadows from Essence. That's what these are. And I don't have any super shock shadows anymore. I had some for a while and some of the initial couple that I purchased myself back when I first started trying ColourPop, I used up and or decluttered during my no buy year. Like they, they eventually kind of like dried out and weren't usable anymore. And I, I have leaned away from these. Sorry, I just keep swatching it because it's so... I mean, you can see it gleaming. It's so beautiful. This is the one called Ironic. I decluttered my Super Shock Shadows mostly because they had like lived their lives. Like I'd hit pan on them. I had used them a lot. It's not like I just got them and decluttered them. I'd really used them quite a lot, but then they also like dried out. And then a friend sent me a gift with a couple of super shock shadows in it that were more like this color. Like the, the color naked or the color warm bronze reminds me a lot of a couple of super shock shadows that I had for a while that I had received as gifts and that I eventually ended up giving away because I didn't end up wearing them that much for the same reason that I have not really loved this all that much, which is that you can get a really beautiful one and done look. But because of that putty quality, because my eyes are so hooded, it tends to gather a little bit. And I don't actually mind the creasing. Like I've gotten to the point where I kind of love that grunged up, kind of slept in, rock and rolly grungy eye, especially when it's a, in a color like this, warm bronze. And even when it has accents of the, something bright silver like this, I just love that messy look on the eyes. But I found that with this putty formula, it causes the eye look to look kind of faded throughout the day. So this is a pretty rich bronze color. And when I put it on, it looks really rich and gleamy and beautiful. And one of the things I really love about this bronze is that it's not warm at all. It's a true neutral bronze. It's not warm tone, even though it's called warm bronze. Most bronzes are actually kind of coppery and this isn't coppery at all. And that's actually kind of hard to find. 
It's what I'm wearing all over my eyes today. And you can see it is a very kind of like bronzy taupe, but I've had this on my eyes for quite a while, maybe like four hours at this point. And you can see that it's kind of faded to like a sort of a soft gray. It doesn't really have the shine. When I first applied it, it had the high shine. That shine was like right on my eyes and really gleaming, really sultry and lovely, almost like a Rowan type dupe. But by this point, it's creasing a little and it's like picking up a little bit and it's just fading and it just looks kind of soft and faded and not bad, but not like what I kind of had bargained for when I first, when I read the description of these, when I opened them, when I first watched them and when I applied them on my eyes today, this more faded smudgy look and, and kind of more subtle look isn't really what I had bargained for. I feel like if I we're in a situation where I was like going out to dinner, but I had like left my makeup bag at home and I needed to go to the drugstore and buy a full look just to carry me through one evening. And I wanted to spend as little as possible, but I wanted to get my signature kind of grungy one and done smoky bronze eye. I would buy this. I would 100% buy this and I would do it. I would just be aware that the look that evening wouldn't be as bulletproof as it would be if I did it with my Natasha Denona shadows. And because in my real life, I do own other eyeshadows and I own my Natasha Denona shadows and stuff, I don't feel like I, I maybe need to keep these. The thing is that in the time that I've used them, I've really kind of messed them around. Like they're, they don't make good gifts. This won't make a good gift anymore to anyone because I've really messed them up. I've, I've stuck my finger all in them. I've smashed them and dropped them and pushed them back into the pans and stuff. I'll decide when I do my reckoning, but they are at the very bottom in terms of my excitement. Everything else that I got from the drugstore to test, I feel either a little bit or a lot more excited about than I do about the continued use in my life of these. Okay, the next one up, the third from the bottom, the third rung from the bottom of the ladder. It's also a little bit scandalous because it's also one that I had very high hopes for. The recommendations, this was the most recommended thing on my Patreon. It's the Flower Beauty Blush Balm. I think it's just a color thing. I think it's the bottom because of color. The formula is really, really good. I, a little bit. So it's at the bottom. It's not the very bottom, but it's near the bottom. A little bit because of formula and a lot because of color. I will say when it comes to the color of this, and I got the color pinched, it is a very light nude or neutral color. And that is something that I really appreciate. I've talked a lot about looking for a really, really pale color, like a pale neutral or a pale white person nude, like a new, something that would be a nude on me that's very pale in a liquid blush. I've talked about that and I've gotten recommendations for this like hundreds of times it feels. Whenever I talk about that, people are like, you should try Pinched from Flower Beauty. And indeed, in terms of its lightness, like in terms of how pale it is, it totally did deliver on that count. And I really love the fact I'm wearing it today, but again, I've had it on for like four hours and it has faded a bit. I put a pretty intense application of it on today because I really wanted to be able to see, I wanted you to be able to see the color and you can see the color, but it, it had, there was more color on my cheeks before. Like it has faded a little since I first applied it, but I have been doing some baby care stuff. So it could be that it like rubbed off on the baby. I don't know. I don't think that it rubbed off on the baby. I think that it just wore, you know what I mean? Like just casual every day. Like this is what happens to makeup. It kind of settles in and it wears a little bit. And in some cases it fades. So it has faded a little bit. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that in terms of the fact that it's a quite light and purportedly nude or rather neutral blush in a liquid form, yes, it's great. It delivers and I love that about it. It's just very peach. It's just really, really peachy. And I'm looking for something that's really neutral, like much more neutral. And I do have swatches of it next to Glossier Dusk and two of the M Cosmetics serum blushes. And I'll roll that footage. I have a, a good swatch of this and I have a swatch comparison. This is the one in the upper left-hand corner that's the pale peachy one. You can see it's very pale compared to those other three blushes. But Glossier Dusk is so much more brown and so much more genuinely neutral. And what I've been looking for this whole time is a blush that's that genuinely neutral, that brown, but lighter in color. And this one, it's lighter. It's just way more orange. And I just don't love that. I, I don't love that orange tinge. And so I found myself unexcited to test this, to reach for it. I have another cream blush in this haul and I ended up using it much more than I used this one simply because of the color. Okay, so those three that are at the bottom are kind of the three 
duds. And, and again, I think you can tell from the actual reviews that I'm giving that they're not total duds. I don't, I don't think anything here was a total dud. But those are the three that I'm kind of like womp womp about for me. This one is at the bottom of the next group because I, I've, and this is the NYX um, Faux Whites Baby Powder Eyeliner. The formula is fantastic. The formula is, it's so creamy. I love this like creamy jelly. I just love that kind of eyeliner for my waterline. And I love applying this. It goes on so satisfyingly gooey. It stays all day. It's a great product. But it is, because it's so white, rather than being like that blue, it doesn't really show up on me as a pop of blue. It shows up as that white waterline, and it's just like a blue-tinged white. That wet, white waterline thing, I, I've seen it work really well on people who are doing like a dramatic eye look where there's a lot on top and a lot on bottom, and it's all smoky. And then that white waterline, it, it provides sort of like this graphic relief from all of the smoke and smudge of the eyeshadow. For me, for some reason, and I think maybe it's because I tend to do maybe more washy, smudgy things, or I've been trying this with more washy, smudgy things, it just ends up not really flattering my eye shape. Like I find when I put this bright white in my waterline, it just, it takes something away from the overall effect. Not, not the eye look. Like if you are examining the eye look close up just as a work of art, as something graphic and, and shape and color oriented, it looks good. But then when you step back and you look at me and I look at you, it's like my eyes don't look quite as good as they did before, I feel, when I put a thing like this in there. So I, I think I'll probably keep this because I don't have that many eyeliners and I don't have any kind of white, or creamy white or faux white eyeliners. I might end up finding other uses for it. And again, I love the formula. But I just, there have been a lot of days when I'm like, oh, I should put that NYX thing in my waterline because I'm testing it for YouTube. And then I just don't do it because I'm not very gung-ho about the way that it's going to make my eye look look. These next two, these have actually been great. These are the Essence lip pencils that I threw into my cart because I wanted to try some more lip liners and I didn't have any bright red lip liner. I've actually used this bright red lip liner, which is in the color So Lovesick. I've used it a lot because I've been wearing a lot. I've used it a lot because I've been wearing a lot of red lipstick. I've been wearing a lot of red lipstick and I'm wearing the one from Lisa Eldridge. It's obviously not a perfect match. This is a more mid-toned blue, and that's like, you know, a rich, rusty, cinnabar, orange, red, not blue. This is a more mid-toned blue-red, or mid-toned red, and that's Velvet Dragon. But it works for getting a more precise line or like just getting that initial layer down that I can blur a little bit, and it's nice. It's a little bit waxy, but it's definitely got that pigment. It goes on pretty evenly. And then it's not uber pigmented, like it she I can kind of shear it out. So it's almost like I just get that faded, softened red lip line. And then I can fill my lips in with any red lipstick and blend the red lipstick into the faded red lip line that this created. The fact that the colors don't match, you can't really see it when you look at me. It's just like a tool that has helped me to get the lip I was going for. So I've ended up reaching for this a lot. I do really like the formula. I think it's like, a, it's a sort of a softly pigmented, like waxily pigmented pencil. This one, I actually thought I wasn't going to keep. It's called Deeply Intoxicated because when I swatched it, it, it's like really dark brown. And I was like, oh, I'm not out here wearing lips that vampy. But then when I started using it, it's actually a very red brown and it blurs out to like a color sort of like Charlotte Tilbury bond girl like a real like a soft berry that's very wearable for me this pencil as dark as it looks is actually wearable for me as an all over the lip lip color this works as a liner for those soft berry nudes and so um actually when i filmed the overhead footage of these things at the end i edited out the things that i think i'm probably not going to keep and i just took some footage of only the ones that i am definitely keeping and when i did that i took this out because at that time it was just a couple of days in I thought I wasn't going to keep it. And now after having spent more time with all of these products, I think I probably am going to keep both of these because I have found myself using both of them on a number of occasions just over the past 10 days. And now I feel like we're moving into sort of the middle upper echelon. Like these next products are ones where I'm like, oh yeah, I'm like nailed it. Like really exciting in a variety of ways. Um, so at the bottom of that next echelon is this Honest Beauty Rose Pink Cream Cheek Blush. And it's just excellent. I mean, it's excellent 
excellent. It just, it's beautiful. The color is beautiful. The color is the reason I think that it's sort of at the bottom of this next echelon of things because the packaging, the performance, the way that it goes onto the cheeks, the way that it wears throughout the day, the finish, which is a little bit of a dewy skin-like finish. It feels like it's really tenacious. It's just excellent. It's The formula is excellent. It's so good. Everything about it is super exciting. And yet I just don't feel like this color of cream cheek is something that I've been waiting my whole life to discover. Maybe at the drugstore though, like maybe a cream cheek product this good is something that I have been waiting my whole life to discover at the drugstore. But I actually think that I might give this away. And you'll see in my final edit in the overhead footage, this is one of the things I pulled out and didn't include in that final group of things that I'm likely to be keeping. Because even though it's above the Essence lip pencils in terms of how excited I am because it, it does excite me and I felt excited to use it and reach for it. I prefer a cream cheek that you can dip your brush into as opposed to like a liquid one that comes in a squeeze tube or a dropper. So there are lots of things that have made me feel more excited to reach for this than I have felt to reach for all of the things that we've discussed thus far in the video. Even though all of that's true, I just know that it's redundant for me personally in my blush collection. So I likely won't end up keeping it. But it's good. It's a great drugstore buy, especially if you have been wanting to sort of tiptoe into cream cheeks or cream blushes and you don't want to spend too much money testing it out because you're not sure that you'll get along well with a cream cheek. I feel like this is a really good option. Next up, the Essence Lash Princess Mascaras. And I feel like my review of these at this point after 10 days, and this is one where it might evolve a little bit, but I have been using them assiduously. I really like worked to get enough experience with these to be able to report back at this point in this video. In a nutshell, it's like, I, I was about to say good, but not great, but I actually think that it's more like great, but not off the charts. Like great, but not like to the moon. I feel like this is an unbelievably impressive, buildable, splink splinky drugstore mascara formula. And I don't feel like I'm going to eschew the testing of higher end mascaras or have no interest in other mascaras ever again because these have completely replaced every mascara that I've ever wanted. I don't quite feel that way about them. I think that they are really buildable if you spend the time, but they're not as buildable as, for example, the one from Gucci. Like that Gucci mascara, it was like the lashes of my dreams. I felt like I had total control and I was able to build and build and build and I could get a really gunky, splinky look or I could get a nice, soft, fluffy, lengthened look. These are like the drugstore version of that kind of thing. And I mean that both as a compliment and as a slight knock in that I'm saying they are like the drugstore version of that kind of thing. Because you can just feel that there's not quite as much of that grip. There's not quite as much control. There's not quite as much fluffiness. Sometimes it can end up looking a little bit sticky, like sticks. But I have loved my lashes every time I've used them. I've just felt like it requires a little bit of finagling. There are so many drugstore mascaras that don't have the goods, like, and high end. I mean, there are a lot of mascaras in the world that you can't build. These have the goods, like you can get them to that point. But I've just found that I end up wanting to stop short of building like a ton of mascara onto my lashes because once you kind of go over past a certain point of building, it, it kind of starts to work against itself. Like it just gets a little bit lashes start getting stuck together a little bit. The Gucci one was infinitely buildable and that was one of the reasons that I fell in love with it. But I do feel like these, they are really giving my drugstore favorites a run for their money. LA Girl Volumatic and Milani Highly Rated. I would definitely buy one of these again if I was, like I needed a mascara, if I was doing the aforementioned like drugstore sweep of stuff to make an eye look for the evening. I've been talking about them as if they're the same. And one is the false lash effect. That's the green one. And the purple one is sculpted volume. I kind of suspect them of being the same formula and just having a different brush. The purple one sculpted volume has a curved brush. And so when you apply it, it makes like it sculpts the lashes it pulls them up and around it curls them if you're someone who curls your lashes and you want them to hold that curl you'll want the purple one the green one the false lash effect has a straight 
thin brush with dense bristles. And so it does kind of build and build and build and it kind of makes the lashes like pop, pop, pop. And I like that. I really like it. But I think I like the purple one better. I've found myself, I'll build some with the green onto my lashes. And then as I go on, I like switch the purple one to get them to curl up and curve around a little bit. So I think that the purple one's probably the winner, but I haven't really noticed a difference in the buildability of the formula. I think it's just the brush that makes a difference. All right, I think what I'm gonna say is that now we're getting into the, the upper echelon. Like these last four products, it's five items, but four products. These last four rungs on the ladder are very close together. It was really hard for me to decide which one of these is going to be like the tippy top and which one is the fourth one from the top. I decided the fourth one from the top is the Maybelline Lifter Gloss, but I love it. Like I love, love, love it. It's almost like all four of these final ones are tied. And I will say that this is the thing that I have worn the most of everything that's here. I must confess, I kind of want more colors. I'm kind of considering getting another color at some point in my future. I mentioned this in a recent video, but I feel compelled to get everyone, everyone in my life who would ever wear a lip gloss, I feel compelled to get them all one of these, each one of them. Grammar, why are you eluding me today? I feel compelled to get each lip gloss wearer or potential lip gloss wearer in my life a Maybelline lip lifter gloss for Christmas. It's just so giftable because it's such a juicy, chunky thing. It's, it's a really, really great product. I've been wearing this even on days when I haven't worn makeup, like when I haven't worn any base makeup. I just find myself reaching for it to hydrate my lips because it's got that, it's like a stiff gel. It really is like a gel feeling thing. It's not liquidy. It's not like a, lo a slippy, glossy, oily thing. It's like a thick, it's like a whipped gel formula. And there's something about the way that that goes onto the lips that's very, very satisfying. Looks beautiful, very close to the top, sparks a lot of joy. But in the number three spot, y'all, stop the presses. I love the Morphe, the Morphe 2 hint hint skin tint it's everything that i wanted the glossier skin tint to be that it wasn't it's everything that i wanted the color pop pretty fresh hyaluronic acid uh tinted moisturizer to be that it wasn't it's everything that i've ever wanted in a light coverage full face product and here's why. It's liquidy and it feels nourishing and it goes on in a very liquidy way. You can spread it out with your hands and it, so it goes on sort of a serum -y skincare way. Then it sets and, it, and it, it does that thing that a good foundation product does or base of any kind, like a, a good concealer, even good color corrector. When it sets, it sort of becomes one with itself over your skin. So it sets in a way that's like anti- breakup, anti-breakage or anti-creasing or streaking. And that was what I struggled with so much with the ColourPop Pretty Fresh Tinted Moisturizer. It was like a, t it really was a tinted moisturizer. It was like a lotion. Always at close range, it would streak on me and you could kind of see like peach fuzz poking, interacting with it in a funny way. And you could see like the texture on my skin interacting, it w interacting with it in a funny way. It was almost like it wasn't enough Pro base product for me. Like it wasn't enough pigment for me. It was too much like a lotion. The Glossier one is better when it comes to the dispersion of pigment, but it's very sheer. It's just, re it really tints your skin. It doesn't provide coverage and it doesn't really help me to combat redness in, in any kind of really aggressive or proactive way. And sometimes my redness is aggressive and it needs to be combated in an aggressive way. The Morphe 2 Hinted Skin Tint. Coverage is good. You'll see in this watch, it is it is light. I mean, it's a light sheer, it's definitely a light coverage thing, but it's good. It's it, I've been able to use it to cancel out redness on a lot of days. And it's the like, color matches good. It's light enough for me, which is like amazing. It's more than I can say for a lot of foundation products. It sets and it just feels, it's not bulletproof like a, like a really intense liquid lipstick or something, but it's not slipping and smudging and streaking around throughout the day. It sets down and it's like good to go. And it looks, I find that it looks really skin-like. And then as my skin warms up throughout the day, as I'm active, it becomes kind of dewy and it ends up looking really nice. It's not a super dewy product. I would say it's almost like a semi-matte to 
skin-like satin. But as it wears throughout the day, it develops kind of a lovely dewiness. What I'd say is that this has become my big guns for complexion. So my preference for complexion is to take good enough care of my skin that I don't need very much coverage. And then just to go in with a little green color corrector for redness, little bit of liquid concealer under my eyes for a little bit of brightness, and then spot concealing if I have to. That's my preference. But my skin doesn't always behave. It hasn't been behaving lately. And so sometimes I need to pull out the big guns. And I haven't really had a product, like a, a hybrid sort of serum foundation product that I love. I haven't really had anything like that until now. And now I have it. So I feel like when my skin's acting up, I'm going to be reaching for this. But probably if I ever get back to a place where I'm waking up with like good, really good looking skin and I don't feel like I need much coverage, probably on days like that, I wouldn't reach for this. I would just use my old standard, my Makeup Forever concealer. All right, top two. Top two. If you've been paying very close attention, then you know what they are just by process of elimination. Second to the top, this Juvia's Place lip liner. And this is in the position it's in because it's got the double header. The formula is amazing and the color is amazing. The formula is good, right? It's really good. It goes on creamy and it's tenacious and it's not drying, but it's definitely stiff enough that you can line your lips. I've also been wearing this all over my lips just as a lipstick, like a lip color. It's so good. It's like that light chocolatey brown of my dreams. I feel like a lip liner, it's kind of just like a really skinny lipstick. That's kind of how I feel about lip liner. The fact that it's skinny makes it so that you can do a lip line with it if you want to combine that with another lipstick. But I use my lip liners as all over lip colors as frequently as I use them just as lip liners, if not more frequently. And I've definitely worn this. I've worn it a couple of times all over my lips just as my lip color. And I've also used it a couple of times to line my lips to prep for similarly brown or similarly like brown nude lip colors. Like I use a little bit of of it on my lips today to prep for the lip color that I'm wearing, which is the one that's in the top slot. I could totally see myself panning this because I just think I'm going to be wearing it like a lipstick pretty assiduously. It's a great product. I'm glad that I tried this Juvia's Place lip product. It, it makes me kind of curious about what else they've got going on with lips over there. And then finally, the top spot, the discovery of the haul, like the main best discovery of this entire thing. Although these top four, I feel like all have been pretty good discoveries. The Maybelline Lifter Gloss, the Morphe Skin Tint and the Juvia's Place Lip Liner in that beautiful color, which is called Sweet Nothing. But the best of the best is the Revlon Super Lustrous Lipsticks. And you know, as I was applying this one today, which is Mink, that's the one that I'm wearing today, I was reflecting that one of the things that's extraordinary about them that I don't know if I mentioned in the haul video is that they don't have an odor. They're completely odorless. They don't smell like a drugstore lipstick. They're not scented at all. They don't smell like chemicals. They don't smell like anything. And that is really great. Like that, I feel like makes them much more recommendable because there doesn't have to be this caveat like, well, but if you don't like scented things, or if you don't like this smell or that smell, you might not like it. I love that they made these scentless. And these, they have it all. The formula is so good. It is that satin, that skin-like satin that ends up looking a bit matte, but not a flat matte. So if you love a matte lip and you don't want something too slippery, I feel like I can safely still recommend these to you because they're going to have that slightly lipsticky sheen when they go on because they're a little bit emollient, but you're not going to end up looking shiny on your lips or having them slide all over the place. They're like the perfect medium, the perfect middle ground on the spectrum of of a finish in the world of lipstick. And I love that because I, I do like a matte look. I mean, I like a glossy look as well, but I feel like I tend to like glossier looks or glosses when they're kind of more sheer and juicy and natural. And when it comes to a color statement, like even, even though this is pretty neutral, because it's so deep on me, it's like I'm wearing a lip. When it comes to a statement like this, I find that they can be easier to wear when they're a little bit matte. They're like not so slippy and not so satin because a richly colored lipstick of this kind, when it's also shiny, it can feel a bit aggressive and it can be harder to wear along with other strong statement things on the face for me. So I like a matte, 
but I have dry lips and I hate it when stuff dries my lips out. And I like the fact that when I apply these, they go on a little bit smooth and satin. They go on a little bit emollient. They have a little bit of sheen to them. They feel nice and nourishing and slippy going on, but then they don't stay so incredibly shiny throughout the entire wear time. And then the colors. The colors are so good. So I have mink and rum raisin and I've been wearing them interchangeably a lot. I've gotten a lot of wear out of them over just the past 10 days. They, they've looked so good on camera. I just feel like they look good with my clothes. They look good with my other makeup. They're just really, really good colors, really special. I feel like both of these are going to go on to be iconic in my life, right? I'm going to use a lot of mink and a lot of rum raisin in the coming years. So that's super fun. And I feel like I'm going to end up featuring them in like best of videos or drugstore recommendations videos. It's really exciting to have discovered a new tried and true. I've been getting a lot of messages both on Patreon on the, the initial thread on Patreon where we were all discussing these drugstore purchases together and in comments on other videos, a lot of comments from people saying that this is like their favorite lipstick or it's such a good lipstick formula. It really does seem like an unhung, unhung, not an unhung zero. It really does seem like an unsung hero at the drugstore and one of these secret gems that isn't really getting the hype that it deserves. I just want to share with you my best affordable makeup. So I went through my makeup collection and I pulled products that are from the drugstore or that are otherwise affordably priced. And they're all products that I think are really great. I love the formulas. I love the colors. I reach for these as frequently and as willingly as I reach for my high-end products. And some of these drugstore products definitely have gotten more use from me than my high end products. Okay, let's start with lip products. So these are the seven lip products that I pulled. These aren't my only drugstore lip products or my only affordable lipsticks or lip products, but these are the seven that when I was going through my makeup collection today, I was like, oh yeah that's a good one. Like these are the ones that really made me feel that fire in the belly today. And some of them I've been wearing a lot lately, especially this one. This isn't actually a drugstore product. It's a tinted lip balm from the small clean beauty brand Erin's Faces. And it's just awesome. It's nourishing, which is great. It feels good on my dry lips, but it looks so beautiful. It's just, the tint is the perfect balance and it's not too pigmented, but it's not too sheer. I feel like I have something on my lips. I look like I'm wearing a beauty product, but it's incredibly comfortable. I mean, it's just the perfect tinted lip balm. Erin sent this to me. It came in the mail maybe two weeks ago, and I would say I've worn it like 10 to 12 out of the 14 days over the past two weeks. I really like this shade, which is called Flushed, because to me, it's like a combination of all of the tones. It doesn't, it looks in the tube like it would be a little bit berry toned, but when I'm wearing it, I just feel like it's not too pink. It's not too orange. It's not too red. It's not too cool toned. It's not too warm toned. It just brings my lips alive with a little bit of depth, pigment, and shine. I also quite like this shade, Blushed. Blushed is a little bit lighter, a little bit more sheer, and a little bit pinker. So it's actually probably even easier to wear. I really like flushed because I like that flushed, bitten lip look, but I've been reaching for blushed like on absolutely no makeup makeup days and kind of in the evenings, maybe even after I've washed my face, stuff like that. It also looks beautiful. This is another tinted product. It's the e.l.f. Sheer Slick Lipstick in the shade Golden Pear. It's a bit more pigmented than the Erin's Faces Tinted Lip Balms, and it feels nice on the lips, but it doesn't feel quite as nourishing. It doesn't have that like skincare feeling. It's really beautiful though. I love wearing this when I have kind of a strong eye look on, and I want to put something on my lips, but I don't want to do the absolute most. These other four are lipsticks, two of which are true HLP classics, and this is one of them. Maybelline Gone Grage. Every time I touch this lipstick or even think about it, what I think is, I'm going to wear that tomorrow. It's kind of a raisin color, like a raisiny mauve, but with a powdery gray 
mixed into it. It has the intrigue and grunge of gray, but it's a really wearable grayish because it has a sort of like purpley brown undertone to it. I find it a very sophisticated, special, easy to wear, but very striking color. I absolutely love it. And the formula is really good. Very creamy, doesn't dry out my lips, but has pretty much the look of a matte. It smells sort of like uh, a vanilla latte. I'm not in love with the smell, but it's not offensive. It's a really, really good formula and a really good color. And this is raw chocolate. It is the matte formula. Gone Grage is in the audacious formula and raw chocolate is in the matte formula. So they smell the same. They both feel creamy and they're both very pigmented, but the matte formula just has a little bit more of a matte finish. This is another one where the balance of tones is just so impressive. It's a rich, warm, rusty brown, and I just find it incredibly wearable. It's a very striking, in some ways an unusual color, but they've managed to make it very wearable. It's the way that I feel about both of these. This is my other favorite lipstick formula at the drugstore, the Revlon Super Lustrous Lipstick. And I like these two shades, Rum Raisin and Mink. Rum Raisin is really, again, really lovely. I like these slightly muted, slightly off tones. So it has kind of a red presence, but it's softened. It's a little bit dirty and it just looks, again, very sophisticated. And then here's Mink. It's more brown than any of them. It is more brown even than raw chocolate. Raw chocolate is a little bit more of like that sienna, that kind of rusty color. And then Mink is just a very, very wearable soft brown. I look at these swatches and I just think, who could ask for anything more? I just love these colors and the formulas are also good. These are such well-formulated products, all seven of them. Let's talk about cheeks. These are the three cheek products that I pulled, the ones that made me feel really excited when I was looking through my collection of products. And this, I actually have been wearing a little bit more lately, but I haven't talked about it on camera in a really long time. So I'm glad that I'm getting the chance to do that. The e.l.f. Active Lip and Cheek Palette. Let's do this really quick. I think that it might be discontinued, so I just wanna get it out of the way. I had to put it in here and I had to mention it because it is my one of my favorite products of all time. I mean, it's like, it's all of these are good that I'm talking about today, but this is like the best of the best. I don't think that it's available on the e.l.f. website right now, but I'll look around the internet. I'll see if I can find it somewhere else. And I know that sometimes products like this will continue to be available in store long after they have stopped selling them online. So I just wanted to include it in case someone's out there and hasn't heard me talk about this before and has been wondering about it. If you, you know, see it at your local drugstore and you're wondering, if it's worth it. My feeling is that it's worth it. I like this formula because it's so soft and it's very pigmented like a lipstick. It's not balmy. It's not semi-sheer. I like that super pigmented and very soft and creamy formula. I feel like I can do whatever I want to do with it. I don't have to fight it. I also love the colors I find the highlighter, oh no, I'm sorry, I swatched, I accidentally swatched the blush on top of the highlighter. But I find the highlighter to be very, very shiny. You can even see it shining through there. And I find the highlighter to be very useful. As you saw, it's the most used of all of these four pans, and that's because I'll often reach for this palette to mix that highlighter with different blushes. I'm using that highlighter a lot. This, I believe, is still available. In fact, I think that Ulta sells it. It's the CoverGirl Clean Fresh Cream Blush in Flushed. And I like talking about this because it really surprised me. I This was given to me. I didn't buy it. And I don't think I ever would have bought it because I would have thought that it was too bright for me, this sort of like strawberry colored cream blush. And it does look incredibly bright. Even as I'm blending it out, you can see that it has that nice pigment just like the e.l.f. ones. The thing is though, when you blend and blend, it takes on this slightly glossy aspect because there's a little bit of pearlized pigment in it 
but then it sets down, it becomes totally budge proof. And I love the sort of feverish look that it gives to my cheeks. It's a really, really beautiful and weirdly natural looking intense flush. Because of the way this color actually ends up looking on the cheeks and because of that slightly pearly finish, this has ended up being one of my most used drugstore products of all time. And it really surprised me. This is the Can Make Cream Cheek in number 16. I use this a lot too. And it's, I think, I mean, the color's great, but I think the reason that I use this so much is that the formula is very attractive. It, it makes me want to use it. it it's sort of soft and, and whipped feeling, foamy, great pigment. And I like putting my brush into this pan. I like opening it and putting the brush into the pan. It, it just, it calls to me. It makes me want to use it because of the way that it's packaged and the way that it applies to the cheeks. Clearly the color is great as well, though. This is a color that really works well for me. Kind of similar to this peach in the e.l.f. active, although in, in practical use it has more red in it than that. I don't know how well you'll be able to tell in the swatch. It's kind of like the marriage of all of these. It's sort of like if you mix them all together, you'd get something kind of like this. And that's how it looks buffed out. You can see that when the pigment is actually sheared out, it has more brown in it than you might think to look at it. Okay, let's talk about base. So some of these products actually have been making an appearance on my channel pretty recently, especially the Wet n Wild Glass Correct the e.l.f. Poreless Putty Primer, and this Purito CC Cream. So let's start with them. I featured the Wet n Wild Glass Correct recently in a video about products that surprised me. I just wasn't expecting it to be so good. I, I love the shine. It's like a really, really wet look shine, not icy at all. I love how well it color corrects my redness, and I love that it provides a smooth and sort of slightly grippy base for the products that I apply on top of it. It's just a fantastic color corrector, primer, and illuminator all in one. It's like a dream product for me. I use the e.l.f. Poreless Putty Primer on days when I want a nice smooth canvas, but I don't want too much luminosity. It provides a very, very smooth surface. You can see here where I've blended it out, where I've kind of like buffed it into my skin. You can see how sort of smooth and bright that part of my hand looks. There I buffed out over this entire portion of my hand and you can really see the difference. It really, really does help to blur texture. I find that it's not totally matte. They make a matte version and a luminous version and it makes sense to me that this one's somewhere in between. It's kind of a satin finish and I find my skin does get a bit luminous throughout the day. You can see how it is reflecting a little bit of light. So it's not adding luminosity like this, but it does, it does give a little bit of a glow to my skin and I like that. This surprised me. I didn't think I would hate it, but I didn't know that I would like it as much as I do. This Purito BB cream has one huge drawback, which is that it only comes in three shades. In fact, this is the lightest shade and it's not light enough for me, so I always have to mix it with something. I usually don't do that. I usually don't like to mess with base products that are too dark for me. I don't like to fight it. But with this one, the quality of the substance feels so good on my face that I find myself reaching for it over and over again. I find myself willing to pay the price of having to like tinker with it to make it work for me because it's so lotiony and it feels so hydrating and it looks so beautiful on the skin, like so incredibly skin-like, but it provides pretty intense coverage. It, it covers everything and I'm always surprised by how easy it is to get a nice clean skin look with it. Even though it's too dark for me, it's very neutral. It's like not too cool or too warm. If anything, it's a little bit gray. I think that's why I'm able to make it work. I wish that they would release a full range of shades though in this. It's an amazing formula. This right here on top is the lightest shade of the Sephora Best Skin Ever Foundation. Underneath it is the lightest shade of the Morphe 2 Hint Hint Skin Tint. The shade is called Hint of Ivory. They're not the same color at all, and they're also not the same texture at all. You can see that the one from Sephora, the one on top, is much more cool toned. It's like a little bit of a bright pink pale shade, 
And Hint of Ivory, the Morphe 2 Hint Hint Skin Tint, it's it's a better match for me. It's more of like a neutral yellow shade. But I find myself reaching for the one from Sephora more because it's more pigmented and it's sturdier. The Morphe 2 Hint Hint Skin Tint, it's not as much of a tint as, for example, the Glossier Skin Tint. And it is surprisingly good, the formula. That's why I included it in this video. It's surprisingly good. I have just realized recently that I like pigment in my base products. If I want a sheer layer, I want to take something pigmented and sheer it out. So this one from Sephora, the best skin ever, that to me is like a really, really useful drugstore priced base product. It's very beautiful, skin-like, lasts for a long time. But this one from Morphe, I included it in this video because for what it is, like a skin tint, a drugstore price skin tint, it's really good. I've tried the one from ColourPop, the Pretty Fresh Hyaluronic Acid Tinted Moisturizer, and I didn't like it because I found it to be too lotion-y. It was like a lotion with pigment mixed in. So I couldn't tell whether the product wanted to sink into my skin, soak into my skin, or stay on top of my skin providing coverage. And I also found that the pigment kind of settled in my fine lines and didn't do well with texture. This, the formula is good. It does pretty well with all of those things, fine line, texture, dispersion of pigment. I just want more coverage than this. Okay, let's talk about eye makeup. I'm gonna swatch these three cream products first and talk about them, and then I'll talk about the palette. Mm, I love all three of these. <laughs> these are such pretty swatches. So this amazing one right here is this eyeshadow stick from Kiko Milano, and I just cannot get enough of this. It's in the shade 46. It's a really sturdy formula. I sometimes put this on my waterline, like as an eyeliner. I also will sometimes buff it out underneath my lash line, underneath my eyes. It also works all over the lid, smudged out, buffed out, as sort of like an oil spill eye look. It's a useful tool and it's also a useful one and done. And you know, it's just, it's like both very, very special and strange and also weirdly practical. It's just a, a really, it's like a unicorn. It's a, a product that I really love. This is something that seems simple, but that I surprise myself by reaching for over and over again. It's just a, a cream eyeliner from Milani. It's in the shade Picante. It's the Stay Put Eyeliner. And it's just such a good formula. It always works. It's always creamy. It's effortless to apply. And I really like this color. I feel like sometimes a pretty simple or neutral eye look can become edgier, become much more special, or really make my green eyes pop better just with the addition of this surprisingly red eyeliner. And of course the e.l.f. putty eye primer. It's fantastic. It works really well. But the thing that I like about this one is the color. I like wearing this just as an eyeshadow. It looks beautiful on the lids. This one is the shade Rose, but it comes in a few different colors. I had to mention the Jungle Lights palette from Flower Beauty because the formula is just so good. Mine's not in the best shape, but I'll give you some swatches. I also did a whole review of this palette, like a, a single video dedicated to it. I'll try to remember to link that down below. It's super creamy. I really like these colors, especially this one on my pointer finger. It's one of my all-time favorite eyeshadows. I'm constantly swatching these next to high-end shadows and they're always showing up those shadows. Like I'll often pull this out and just do comparison swatches when I'm like, like reviewing something else. And I don't know, they just always look amazing. That creamy, crushy pigment, pretty much nothing beats it. Flower Beauty has released a second palette that I think is in this same formula in a different color story. It's the Desert desert lights or desert something palette. I know some of you all have been asking me to review it and I, I am going to try to do that. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I don't know if the formula is exactly the same because I haven't tried it, but everything points to it being the same. I hope that it is because this is one of the best eyeshadow formulas out there in my opinion, especially at the drugstore. So they would be foolish not to keep making more of these in different color stories. And that's it, y'all. A roundup of some affordable products that I think are really great, some of which I use a lot. 
And listen, you might not need new makeup right now. You might already have a foundation that works really well for you or some cream blushes that you're trying to get through. And so just because these are great doesn't mean that you need them and that you need to rush out and get them. But if you are in the market for something like a new eyeshadow palette, or if you're looking for a combination illuminator and green color corrector or something like that, if you are on a budget and you need some go-to products that are going to work for you, I hope I was able to point you in the right direction in a couple of these cases. A YouTube classic, testing drugstore dupes for iconic high-end makeup product. To start, I just have a little bit of sculpting and shaping in my brows, but nothing else on my face. And that's because one of the products is a primer. As soon as I saw this in the store, I was like, aha, this looks exactly like the packaging for the Makeup Forever color correcting primers. And I used to use the green Makeup Forever primer a lot until my no buy year and I reassessed my relationship with the cost of the things I was buying. And I realized it was actually really expensive per ounce. And then I kind of backed away. But I just, I have a lot of experience with what, what I think this product is trying to dupe. So this is a L'Oreal Prime Lab Advanced Derm Primer up to 24 hour redness eraser with 4% niacinamide. Okay, it's looking pretty promising. I was worried based on the pale mint packaging that it was gonna be really, really pale and basically super white based, but it's looking greener than that. It looks greener than the outside packaging and it looks a lot like the Makeup Forever. It definitely doesn't have that comforting milky OT smell. <laughs> I just remember the Makeup Forever one having this kind of like oat smell. This has more of a, what is that? It's like the slightly perfumed makeup smell. So right off the bat, it's not as beefy as some primers. It's really melting into my skin rather than doing that silicone-y thing where it sits on top. I feel like this is more like a color corrector, like a skin prepping color corrector, color correcting lotion. And wow, it's very effective at color correcting. It's interesting. It didn't add moisture or tackiness or pore filling or provide a sort of slick surface for makeup. It really feels like, I mean, it feels smooth. Yeah, my skin feels a little smoothed compared to the other side, but I actually feel like the thing that it mostly did was green color correcting, which surprises me because usually green color correcting primers, I find they prime the skin however well the formula primes the skin and the green color correcting quality just sort of goes away. Like it rubs and soaks into the skin. And I always need to go in with like an actual post potent green color corrector that's just makeup in a tube like this on top. And that's why I brought that down because I thought that I would likely have to do that, but I don't think I'm gonna have to do that today. I mean, you can obviously see this side is starting to match my undertone, match my neck, and the redness has been like, the sting of the redness has been taken out. This side, I have more blemishes on this side, or really these are healing by now. These are just like scars, but you know, even be behind that, you can see the redness with which I usually wake up in the morning and it's just been obliterated by this <laughs> rather impressive product. Let's catch up the other side. The smell, it's not fruit and it's not floral. It's almost a little bit chemical. It's like a biting, maybe citrus. Maybe citrus is what it's trying to be. It's a bit strong, but it goes away quickly. So that is the outcome of what was essentially one layer, a pretty hefty layer, right? I could have spread it a little bit thinner, but I sort of went for it. I've got to say I'm gooped and gagged, and I don't say that lightly. A very powerful and elegant color corrector. It isn't as cosmetically elegant as a primer as the one from Makeup Forever. It's left my skin feeling kind of dry. So actually, if you have oily skin, this might be the thing because it, it hasn't given any sort of moisture or slickness. It doesn't feel like skincare, not at all. And I feel like the Makeup Forever one you know, it feels high-end, it feels nourishing, it feels yummy, it feels calming. Whereas this, it's like it has one job, which is to cancel out that redness and it is slaying at that job. I think I'm gonna keep using this. And also, you know, I keep saying that it hasn't really primed my skin, but we'll see how makeup goes on on top of it. I feel like that's what will really tell the tale. Can you believe that? It's also, you know, I think less than a third of the price of the one from Makeup Forever and a lot of product in here compared to little tubes of color corrector like this. So as far as I'm concerned so far, this is a success story. Not a perfect dupe, right? Like not a spot on dupe for the Makeup Forever one. I actually think it's a better green color corrector than the one from Makeup Forever. And 
and a little bit less nourishing feeling of a primer, although it says it has niacinamide in it, which in theory would even out your skin tone with continued use. It's a good skincare ingredient, and that's what it says on the back. So not a spot-on dupe, but a delightful drugstore discovery. Okay, next up, a product that is definitely trying to be a dupe for a high-end product. This is the e.l.f. Halo Glow Liquid Filter, and it is a dupe for the Charlotte Tilbury Hollywood Flawless Filter. It's in glass packaging, very fancy, and it's got that same huge doe foot applicator, that big beefy doe foot that Hollywood Flawless Filter has. It's also, unfortunately, the like dark beige color that I think still is the lightest shade of Hollywood Flawless Filter. And that's why I'm gonna put it on now before I've gone in with any other kind of complexion product because I don't know how dark it's gonna be on me and how much I'm gonna have to cover it up. It looks so pigmented too that my first impression is that it's not gonna be as shiny as other other products like it. Let's see. I know that this isn't new, but I had somehow missed it. And when I was at Ulta, actually, I asked this really lovely employee named Leah if she could think of anything that was like a clear, obvious drugs were duped for high end. And she led me straight to this product. And I was like, oh, that's perfect for the video. So thanks, Leah, if you're watching. Hey, girl. I used to have Hollywood Flawless Filter. It got kicked out of my collection by Auric Glow Lust in the new shade of Morganite, which is a way better match for my skin. But this feels like it. It feels thick like it, it has pigment like it, and by it I mean flawless filter. It is doing that kind of pore disappearing thing that flawless filter does, and it's also doing that thing where it's not metallic in person, it's not like turning my cheeks into the Tin Man's cheeks, but when it catches the light, it beams. It's also setting down. It's giving me time to work with it, but it's eventually setting down completely. It's staying on the skin and it's not pilling. A good dupe. I actually think this is a good dupe and the one disappointment is just, for me, I wish the shade range were broader, but just like with false Filter, I wish that there was a lighter shade. It was much more neutral and more pale because it's just darker than my skin. So it's awkward because I can put it on my cheeks, but I have to kind of blend it with complexion products. I have to sort of semi cover it up. It's so peach for me that it inevitably changes the color of whatever blush I put on top of it. And so it's just not the same as having a product like this that matches one's complexion, which I have in Auric Glow Lust, and that's really awesome. So not for me, because there's not a match, but you know, if you've always really wanted to know what it would be like to have Hollywood Flawless Filter, like how it would be to have that in your routine if you'd make use of it, because it's sort of this in-between product, you know, it can be used all over, it has some pigment, but it's really, really glowy. If you've just always had a burning curiosity about that, but the actual Hollywood Flawless Filter is out of your price range, this is a good way to try it to like try out this genre of product and see how it goes. So I don't have anything for my complexion other than those two. I don't have like a foundation or concealer from the drugstore that looked like a high-end dupe. There are a lot of pretty looking ones, but all of them have that problem where the shades that are light enough for me are really saturated with either peach or pink or yellow. There's nothing that has that sort of grayed out, neutral, desaturated tone. And that has long been a problem at the drugstore. I mean, it has long been a problem for me everywhere. And only recently some brands have started to offer makeup that matches me better, and those brands all happen to be high end. So I'm just gonna throw on a little bit of Monica Blender Blender Cover, which I've recently pulled back out, kind of fallen back in love with. I'm gonna put a thin layer of this all over my face, spot conceal a tiny bit, and then I'll be back. Okay, a couple of things. One, I feel like I didn't have to use as much of blender cover as I have been using because the L'Oreal product, Prime Lab Redness Eraser, did such an incredible job of bringing my skin tone to the actual color that it would be if I didn't have redness. So a lot of the skin on my face was left after this product just looking how I want it to, exactly how I want it to, and not needing any coverage. I just, because I have some unevenness, because I have some healing blemishes. I felt like I could do with a little bit of coverage, but it almost brightened it up like a tiny bit beyond what I would have wanted. Like it's really, really as pale now as my neck right here. And that's quite pale, you know? So it, I could have stood, I think, to use even a little bit less of the blender cover. This product also didn't give blender cover any trouble. It layered on perfectly well. It didn't pill or anything. And I was kind of putting it to the test because blender cover is a stiff cream foundation. So it really needed to be buffed and pressed into the skin. And 
that would have disturbed this or caused it to pill if anything was going to. So ever more impressed as the video wears on by L'Oreal Prime Lab, 10 out of 10 so far. Also note that I didn't go over my cheeks with blender cover. That's why it looks like I have cheek makeup on. I mean, I do have something on my cheeks, which is this stuff, but also, you know, I don't need coverage there. I don't need to turn my cheeks bright white again and then to only color them with pigment again on top of that. So I just left them. Overall, I have ended up with a face that has glossy cheeks, a skin tone that matches the rest of my body, but not too, too much makeup on it which is my goal every day, you know? So well done so far, drugstore. Okay, next up I have this mascara, which I actually found, I Googled. When I was in the store, I Googled drugstore dupes for Charlotte Tilbury mascara because I specifically wanted to know if there were any that are kind of legendarily dupes for Charlotte Tilbury mascaras. I don't know why, because I've never tried a Charlotte Tilbury mascara. So this is going to be more about letting you know if this is a good mascara or not, rather than letting you know if it's a dupe for the Charlotte Tilbury. But it also kind of fascinates me. And I think, I think that the telescopic, which is what this is, L'Oreal telescopic, I feel like this or the new iteration of it, which is called telescopic lift, I feel like it's been having a moment lately. So I was like, let's just see what it's about. When I looked it up, this came up as a dupe for whatever sort of the original Charlotte Tilbury basic mascara is, the one that has the really skinny rubber wand with the short bristles, which is what this also has. Yeah, look at that, really skinny. Like the brush is just as skinny as the wand. I'm very curious about how this is going to go because this isn't usually the kind of mascara that works the best for me. Although once in a while, once in a while, one like this will really surprise me. Okay, first impression. I like the little wand because it feels, it feels dainty. Like it's just, I, it feels cute. I'm like, mm. and it also, because it's so little and delicate, it's very easy to manipulate. It's depositing a lot of product onto my lashes. It's building very easily. We're definitely getting length. I'm having to work a little bit harder to get girth, but I feel like we're getting there. So there are the results of me having worked at it and worked at it just with one brush, having dipped it in one time and not really having let it dry between coats. I think this is what most people would call one coat you know, but I did build it up a bit. So it's looking pretty good. And uh, a couple of caveats. One, I feel like my lashes aren't at their best right now. I feel like lashes kind of go through phases. Sometimes they feel really thick and full. And sometimes it feels like they're thinned out a little bit. And no matter which mascara I use, I can't quite get them to be as wonderful as they sometimes are. And I'm in that latter phase right now. So I'm sure that the mascara's performance is being impacted by that a little bit. And the other thing is often a mascara isn't its very best the first time out of the gate. Usually Usually it needs a week or so, maybe a couple of uses at least before it starts to be how it's going to be. So given that those two caveats are in place, this is an impressive show, right? And I can see why it came up in the search. I don't know what the Charlotte Tilbury one is out there doing for people, but I can understand why people are satisfied with this as a replacement for a high-end mascara or just as a mascara. It's fun to use because of the little skinny little brush. And, you know, as I build it, it's starting to get that nice kind of fibery, gripping on itself, fractals upon fractals quality that I quite enjoy. And I thought when I first started using it on the other eye, I thought I was going to say that it has good qualities, but that you probably can't get a wispy lash with it. I actually don't think that's true. I actually think there's something about the brush with just one or two coats, spreading out the lashes delicately with the brush and then stopping. You can actually get kind of a slightly fluffy, wispy lash with it. Okay, I have more to say after working on this eye for a while. For some reason, I've struggled a lot more on this side. Maybe it's because I went on for too long, got over enthusiastic, but it just, it started to get kind of clumpy. It ended up kind of spidery and not necessarily in the good way. I think I would have been happier if I had just left it at like a light lash look, like a light wash on the lashes. But because it's called telescopic, I was sort of getting this impression that it's supposed to really, really build. But it's like the more I build it, the harder it becomes to comb through what's there and get like a soft, even or fluffy look. So I've ended up with laden, kind of quite made up looking lashes. I feel like that is beautiful sometimes. And I actually really do like that sometimes, but not all the time. And now that I've gotten there, I can't scale it back. So I feel like the jury is still a little bit out on this. I think it's always a mistake to take a total first impression of a mascara without a grain of salt. You know what I mean? You always have to wait on a mascara. So this this would be true in any case, but particularly because it's a little hard for me even to tell at this moment what it's going to be like as I use it over time. And, you know, I'll definitely be using this in future videos and I'll report back about it. 
Okay, now we're getting, we're really getting into the juicy stuff. <laughs> Look what I have. I've never tried anything from Makeup Revolution, Revolution Beauty, or any of those adjacent brands. But when I saw this, I was like, oh, I've got to include that in this video. So this is the Makeup Revolution bold, bold face, bald faced, bold faced. So this is the Makeup Revolution bold faced dupe of the Jones Road Miracle Balm, which I have reviewed at length. I will link those videos if you're interested in the Jones Road Miracle Balm. I'm your girl. Check the description box. I talked about this in my most recent new makeup hot takes. It's very, very obviously a dupe for Miracle Balm. And look at that color. Isn't that nice? The colors are slightly different. I only have one shade of Miracle Balm left in my life, and it's the shade Natural, which is basically clear. Right, it's clear with just the the tiniest hint of like this foggy pink. That's much built up. It's much darker in the pot than it actually is. When you swatch it out, it's just like a clear chapstick. So the shades are different. This Revolution Balm is in the shade Natural Nude. I think the lightest shade shades are a bit different. And I have no idea how pigmented this is going to be. Obviously, the sizes are different. But you know, I'm not mad at it because the pot of Miracle Balm is just massive. Like too big, you know? I'm also not mad at this little tin tin. Better than a plastic. Plastic tin. Okay, texture very similar. Smell similar. It's a little bit more pure ginger and lemongrass, a little bit less mysterious. In fact, the, the Jones Road one by comparison smells a little musty. <laughs> this is really interesting so far. Okay, let's see how much pigment it has. Unfortunately, I don't have a pigmented Jones Road Miracle Balm here. I mean, I'll show you. I spread it out right there. It's just clear, right? So I, we can't compare this directly, but I do have my memories. And here's how I feel about it. This is a slightly more more makeup-y product. It feels like it's melting away to what I would describe as a cream rather than a wax or like a, a liquid wax or a melted wax, which is what the actual Jones Road Miracle Balm feels like. This feels like a cream blush. Some of the Miracle Balms are pretty pigmented. This is also on the more pigmented side, probably about as pigmented as some of them and much more pigmented than others of them. Let's see how it applies. It's pretty. I mean, the, the color is really pretty. I like that the color isn't buffing out to have too much orange in it. I was a little worried about that based on what I saw in the pan. You know, it has obviously the dupe for the Hollywood Flawless Filter underneath it, so this isn't the pure test of what the glossiness would look like, and I'll continue to test it and I'll, of course, report back. But it's applying a lot like Miracle Balm, and it's really here on the back of my hand because it's not adulterated by the shiny product underneath. It's here on the back of my hand that I can really tell what the quality of the product is like. And yeah, it's just slicker. It's slicker. Jones Road Miracle Balm has this sort of stiff, sturdy quality, and they didn't quite nail that with this. It feels kind of like a liquid when it melts, which you kind of, you know, you have to, and it melts much more easily than Miracle Balm. When it melts, it starts to feel kind of like a liquid blush that you squeezed out of a tube, you know? It seems like that's that's the way the formula behaves. And it's making me want to use a brush with it instead of using my fingers because it feels more like makeup and less like skincare. And this is the thing that I always have said about not just the Miracle Balm, but about a lot of Jones Road products in general. Their skincare, their like tinted skincare, you have to like think about them that way and use them that way, really rub them into the skin. And they end up with this really, really natural one with the skin nourishing quality. And they end up feeling like they've left behind this protective layer, really pretty natural protective layer. And yeah, this isn't that. This is like, this is a cream blush. I'm like wanting to apply it with a brush that feels much more natural to me. I've let it drift down a little bit on the sides of my face. I'm going to clean that up a tiny bit and then we'll talk. Okay, here's how I'm feeling right now about Makeup Revolution Miracle Balm. Not a good dupe. I, I feel like they weren't going to be able to do it. You know what I mean? They weren't going to be able to dupe Miracle Balm with its really luxe feeling combination of waxes and pigments with that sort of special, that magical je ne sais quoi that Bobbi Brown put into it. You know, I'm not super surprised that it's not a spot on dupe. However, the question is, is it one of those situations where it's not a good dupe, but it is a good product? Or is it not a good dupe and not really a great product because it's reaching for this thing that it's not catching and then kind of falling into the middle, the gray area and languishing. I think time with this product will tell the complete answer, but my instinct right now, my first impression is that it might actually be a little bit that, a little bit not a good dupe and therefore, because it's trying to be not really a super great product. And here's why. Cream blushes that have this kind of melty quality, they tend to work better when they're 
quite pigmented. Because when they have this quality and they have that semi-pigmented, like pigment suspended in a Vaseline-y cream formulation, it's hard, at least it's hard for me to keep them from going patchy. I like the substance. Like I like the way that it feels. I really like the color. I like the way that it applies. But I had to keep fussing with it and fussing with it and fussing with it to get the color to be even. And I never had that problem with the pigmented versions of Miracle Balm, except for the bronze one, because of all those little shiny particles. It did that thing where the color would sort of layer and pick up in some places and not in others, and it would end up being a bit patchy. I just feel like the way this has ended up being formulated, because they tried for a Miracle Balm and they landed more on a cream blush formulation, it doesn't have enough pigment for its texture for me right? That's my personal preference, my personal experience. When I first started swatching it out and playing with it, I was like, oh my god, it's like, it's so creamy, it's so lush, it's the color so beautiful. And I do like the look that I ended up with. But because of that issue of fussiness, I could see myself testing this a few more times for the tube, like testing it for you so that I can report back, and then never wanting to use it again because I would rather reach for something more reliable, like the Cure Weiss cream blush. Even the Merit flesh balms, I feel like, are trying to do something very similar. Like, it's really, really, really similar. Experience of going in with a brush on my hand with that stuff there, that's very similar to what the flesh balms are serving, but they don't have that patchy pigment problem that I think that this might end up having. And lastly, another product from Revolution. Almost everything they do is a dupe, and it was hard for me not to source everything from that section. That was actually why I appealed to Leah in the Ulta store. I was like, I can't see the forest for the trees here, and, and this can't just be like a Revolution beauty video. I wanted to have dupes from some other brands. But I really wanted to try this in particular. The Revolution Beauty Shimmer Balm. To me, a clear attempt at a dupe for the Fenty lip gloss. Even the doe foot is similar. That big juicy doe foot. Remember when Fenty first launched their lip gloss? That was sort of the first time that had been done, right? The feeling of having like a huge oversized doe foot to apply lip gloss and now it's all over the place, but Fenty was the first. Let's see how it feels. Okay, first of all, it smells like nothing like the Fenty. It smells like icing. Really, really sweet, like really sweet cookie icing or sugar icing candy. A little bit like what Fenty was going for, but much more synthetic. Mmm. And texture, nothing like it. It's really thick. It's not sticky as such, but it doesn't have that like, mm, this is reminding me of how much I actually like the Fenty lip gloss. That gloss, it's got that watery quality, like juicy liquid fluid, almost like a lip oil and just wet. Wet, but sturdy. Whereas this is like thick. If you had a bowl full of the Fenty lip gloss and you put the back of a spoon on top of it and lifted it up, it would just be, it would react like water. You know what I mean? Or like a really, really liquidy syrup. But with this, you could get stiff peaks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the egg beater, egg whites beaten to a fluff. Like you dip the spoon in and it would be like a stiff peaks. It just feels like a much stiffer, thicker formula. The color of this is obviously also icier than the original. This comes in a lot of colors and so does gloss balm. So it probably is a color dupe for some one of the gloss bombs. Either that or there is one in the range that's like closer to the original than this, but it's not the color that I'm objecting to. I actually kind of like that pale icy pink on me. It's not that it's the, it's the like jelly gloss thickness of it that I might be able to get behind if it didn't have such a strong synthetic sweet smell. But the combination of that jelly gloss feeling, that super, super thick icing feeling, and the really sickly sweet candy icing smell makes it kind of a fail for me. Like I'm not dying to wear it again. It just, it has a like slightly nasty drugstore gloss quality in spite of its beautiful luxe packaging and the pretty color. You hear that? So yeah, for me, not a good dupe, not even by a long stretch, and not, unfortunately, a good product either. Interesting, because the two Revolution products that are, I feel like, the ones that are trying the hardest to be dupes, well, this one's trying pretty hard to be a dupe. But Revolution's like a dupe brand. Like, that's their mission, you know? These are the two that I feel like fall farthest from the tree. Like, I, I feel like they are duping the products, the high-end products that they're referencing in form, but not in function. And they're not really that worried about actually delivering what the high-end products deliver to the user. You know what I mean? They're 
trying to match all of these different aspects, like the packaging, the advertising, even the scent, but they're just not trying that hard to do that. And they're not really thinking about what all of those things add up to, like what the sum of the parts is for the Jones Road balm, what the outcome of the adding together of all those parts is. They're not really trying to dupe that outcome. And they're definitely not trying to do that with the gloss either. So, so far, not so good with Revolution Beauty, but this does kind of make me want to investigate a little more and find out if they have products in their lineup that are supposed to be good, like that people really like people. <laughs> At the very least, I can't wear this gloss to film. So that basically takes it completely off the table for me. We'll get through it. But these other brands that aren't dupe brands, but just have clearly decided to reference high-end products with these particular pieces of makeup, they to me performed much, much better. So quick recap, L'Oreal Prime Lab, the green one, not a perfect dupe, but does a lot of what the Makeup Forever version does and a very very, very good product probably the one of all of these that I'm the most excited to keep using. ELF Halo Glow Liquid Filter, excellent dupe, spot on dupe. In fact, it's too good of a dupe. It even duped the fact that there isn't a shade for me in the Charlotte Tilbury Hollywood Flawless Filter line. I'll probably give it away to someone who matches it better, but that person's gonna love it. L'Oreal Telescopic, jury's still out. It could go either way. It's gonna take me a week or two. We'll get back to you. Revolution Beauty Balm Glow, mm, I'll try again, but I feel like it's gonna be a no. And the Revolution, Shimmer Bomb. <laughs> It's already a no. So we went to Ulta. The first thing they did was to pick out some drugstore dupes for high-end products. And that's a separate video that I've already filmed. It should actually already be up on the channel. But as I was poking around the drugstore section of Ulta, I also noticed that there were several pieces of makeup that just intrigued me for one reason or another. So I collected a little group of those and that's what this video is going to be. I did decide to add the e.l.f. camo color corrector to this video because a lot of you have asked me to review this. This is a pretty recent launch from e.l.f. Not like brand, brand new, but one of the newer color correctors on the market. And you know me, I love a green color corrector and this is a really affordable option. I think it's like $4. e.l.f. often does things well. It doesn't look too pasty, you know? I kind of have high hopes. Here's how the tube looks out of its cardboard packaging. Hmm, promising, promising. I do have on a little bit of primer, uh, the EXA primer. So it's really green, which I actually quite like. It kind of reminds me of the level of green, level of intensity of the LA Girl one, which was really, really punchy, but just, it's like it cancels out the redness and that's all it does when it's mostly green and not a lot of other stuff mixed in. Looks like that might be what this is doing. Yeah, it's really pigmented. The green, I mean, the, there is a strong presence of green pigment. It's not just like fading away. So it's greener than the one from EXA. The one from EXA has kind of a gray neutral undertone. That's the one that I like because I have a very gray neutral quality to the tone of my skin. Actually, I have it right here. You can just see through the tube what a different tone it is. But I think that that will make this one from e.l.f. more skin tone versatile. It's a strong enough color. It's like a punchy enough green that I can imagine it working really, really well on a bunch of different skin tones to cancel redness. A little bit goes a long way. And in terms of the formula, it doesn't make much of itself. It's just doing its job and it's not doing anything else. It's not moisturizing. It's not creamy, but it's also not pilling, not making a problem. It feels just like green paint, like green pigment paint kind of. And you know, it worked. I'm going to add even a little more. Yeah, you can really see the difference there between like the red toned skin here and my much more neutral skin with the product on it. So a little bit goes a very long way. I think that it's easy to over do it actually, you could end up looking green, especially if you don't have olive toned skin, which I do. My skin can take a lot of green color corrector without me looking green because I'm actually a bit green. The rest of me is like, you know, you can see it right there. Basically a frog, a frog that's never seen the light of day. But you know, that might mean that it's an ideal version of this, especially drugstore version for someone with an olive undertone. And even if you don't have an olive undertone, you're just trying to cancel redness, you can still make it work. It's just, you only need a teeny teeny bit. It's very pigmented. The thing that it's not is skin carry. And I like a skin carry green color corrector. You know, I like to feel like it's kind of a hybrid skin care makeup product because it does go in that place in between skin care and makeup. It's like a priming product. This isn't delivering that. I think that's the thing that you're not getting because you're paying so little for it, but it is doing everything else. 
It's also, I'll say, not the most spreadable. I think that's the thing that I keep fussing with it and that I've been trying to like get at. It's not the most spreadable. It's not getting patchy or pilling or doing a weird layering thing or anything. Like I, I am able to spread it. It's just, it's very green where I first put it down and then it's taking like more work than other green color correctors take for me to get it to not look like a green paint swatch on my skin and just to change the color of my skin. And I think that that's why of the two drugstore green color characters that I've tried over these two videos, this one and the one testing dupes, I think I prefer the one that's a dupe for the Makeup Forever Primer, the L'Oreal product that I tested in the other video, because it's more liquidy, it's more spreadable, it's very effective, but I feel like I'm having to work harder with this e.l.f. one to get the result that I was getting with just one really quick layer with the L'Oreal one. And the L'Oreal one, similar to this, doesn't really have skincare qualities, doesn't doesn't really change the texture of the skin, doesn't really moisturize, although it does have niacinamide in it, so presumably it brightens over time. It's just both of them are quite green and quite purely about color correcting. So I'm getting the same result that I got when I tested that other product. It's just this one's a little bit fussier. It's also less than half the cost. I think the L'Oreal one is like 10 or $12. This is only four. So do with that what you will. The verdict on this is that it works. It's not absolutely everything. It didn't blow my socks off, but it's decent, decent to say the least. And wow, the magic of green color corrector. It gets me every time. So once again, I don't have any drugstore complexion products. Complexion is a little bit of a tough one for me at drugstore because of my tone and undertone. So I, again, I'm gonna use the Monica Blender Blender Cover, love it so much, and a little bit of NARS Spot Concealer. My skin was so color corrected that, again, I didn't need to use very much blender cover. I used even less than I used the time when I used that L'Oreal green color correcting primer. That's really satisfying to me. <laughs> I love the result and I like that. I didn't have to use too much makeup and I like that I didn't have to put in too much effort. Let us move on to what is to me one of the most intriguing things in this video. This is a L'Oreal Voluminous Brown Balm Mascara. So I was looking for a brown mascara because I haven't had one in a really long time. I've been really appreciating more natural looking makeup lately. And on those days when I wear extremely light makeup, I mean, my lashes are so pale that I often just want to put something on them even if I'm wearing almost no makeup. But most of my mascaras are quite dramatic. They're all black and they're all quite dramatic. And even if they weren't quite dramatic, just the fact that it's a black mascara, which isn't really natural to my coloring, makes it makeup-y. So I've been curious about brown mascaras out there. And this is not only brown, but it's I assume trying to give an even more natural look because of being a balm formula. I haven't, did I miss something? Like I haven't heard of balm mascara. Was this a thing? Was this like a boat that I missed? Was it a trend? I don't even know if this is a new release or how old this is or what. This is our first balm in mascara with only essential ingredients. Nice. For fuller, silkier, healthier looking lashes, iconic volume, ultimate care, no compromise. So it's saying it's a balm mascara, but that it lifts and volumizes still. It's like, if it does everything that it's saying it's doing, it's my dream. Like I dreamed it up and then it came to life. Here's the packaging. And look at the before and after picture on there. I couldn't get it to focus on the before and after picture, but it does look like it's not not dramatic. You know what I mean? It's not saying that it's a supernatural lash, just that it's a balm formula. There's the packaging. There's the brush. It's a little spiky brush. The packaging looks like vintage to me. It looks like a mascara from the late 80s. I cannot wait to see what this is like. Okay, first impressions. It's brown, but it's dark brown. I think for me to get a really natural color of mascara, I'm gonna have to maybe go to K-Beauty and look for like a light brown mascara. Brown in the drugstore in America tends to be like black brown or blackened brown, you know what I mean? There is a lot of pigment on the brush, a lot of substance on the brush, and it gave me instant volume and presence, as you can see, like really built up in a fibrous way on my lashes. Way better than the L'Oreal Telescopic mascara that I tried in the other drugstore video recently. Way more effective than that, I vastly 
prefer this. It just feels a lot easier to work with and I'm getting better results right away. If I didn't know that it was supposed to be a balm mascara, I feel like I might not notice anything different. So I was sort of expecting to feel somehow like silkier and lighter and feel a little bit more like I was just painting my lashes with sort of a coat of balm rather than applying a mascara. I do kind of feel like the formula is light on my lashes, but I think that that's probably just psychological. Like what would that even feel like? I think I might just be projecting because it's called balm mascara. But first impression, I would absolutely wear this again. Like I would pick this up. I'm going to, it's going to be the first thing that I reach for tomorrow because I do feel like it has a kind of elegant simplicity about it. It's giving me results very quickly. It's easy to use. I'm not having to fight with it. <laughs> you know, it's basically what I want from a mascara these days. Okay. Here on the other side, I applied it much more tentatively, like just trying to do what I described, like coat my lashes almost with a coat of paint. And I got a much wispier, much more natural, easier to wear lash. It also looks more brown rather than deep, almost black because there's not as much on it. I feel like that's what I would do on a day when I was wearing really, really light makeup. And I sort of see the silky balm-like quality that, that maybe they're talking about in the application. It's kind of too late for me to try it, but I bet that this is also one where if I like wiped the brush off with a tissue, it would give me a very natural, just like darkened lash. Okay, so on this side, initially, even after I had put on that very light layer, I got a much silkier, softer, more kind of combed through lash to begin with when I started building it. And on this side, it was like instant sort of textured volume. But I think now that that might have been just because it was the very first time I had pulled the wand out. So the wand came out of the tube kind of loaded with everything that had been clinging to it for the entire time that this was sitting on the shelf at the drugstore. Once it kind of got that out of its system, it sort of earned its name of like a balm on this side more. But I then went back and built it up even more on top of that to make this eye match this eye. So I ended up with a little bit more of a dramatic-y, mascara-y look. But that's kind of cool because it means that you can get that silky, balmy lash. But if you want to build for drama, you can build for drama, which is kind of great. I'm excited about this mascara. So I feel like all that remains about this is to learn whether it gets super crunchy and flaky or smudgy because that's the thing about the telescopic that I tested in the other video. I'll probably have pinned a comment about this. By the end of the day, it was crumbling off of my lashes in like these big chunks and one of them got into my eye. It was like really annoying and I don't want to use it again because of that. Maybe because this is a balm, it stays soft like stays waxy. But if that's the case, then I feel like it's running the risk of being quite smudgy. So I will keep an eye on it as it wears throughout the day. I'll pin a comment about how it wore throughout the day. If it doesn't flake, crumble, or smudge, it could be a winner. We could be looking at a winner. All right, let's move on. A very intriguing piece of drugstore makeup that isn't new in the least. So this is something that has intrigued me for years and that I finally found a place for in the course of things in my reviews, you know? So this is the e.l.f. cream contour palette. You all know that one of my favorite blush products of all time, if not my favorite, is the e.l.f. active lip and cheek palette, which was limited edition and is totally discontinued now. And I don't think you can find it anywhere. But I learned through my love affair with that palette that I'm a big fan of the e.l.f. cream cheek formula. But usually I don't like the putty. I don't like the e.l.f. putty stuff. I like the cream palettes. And, you know, for me with blushes, they're usually too bright, too pigmented, too saturated saturated, too middle of the road in terms of the tone, like too pure of tone. I like those muddy, mucky colors. And I've realized that if these were marketed as blush colors, which I feel like they could easily be, not this brightening, like this highlighting, that's like a, it's it's not sparkly, but it's like a matte white highlighter for sculpting. So not that. But these other three, I could totally see a blush range in which each one of those is a color. I mean, they would be sort of bronze leaning blushes, but that exists. So I have long one wondered if these are similar in formula to the e.l.f. Active Lip and Cheek. They feel right off the bat a little bit harder. Like the e.l.f. Active Lip and Cheek has these soft lip sticky pans that your finger just sinks into. These feel a little bit harder and therefore balmier. I wonder if I can break the surface. Well, so I broke the surface a little bit and now it's starting to get that like lip sticky richness. So I'm like pressing into the pan a little bit to work up some more goop. Mmm, it's so satisfying. So here's 
how the pans looked. I've just messed them around a little bit. Sorry, I didn't give you a close up before I did that, but this is what makeup looks like, you know? Here's how the colors look on my fingers. Clearly the light one is the one that is the most likely candidate for me, but I think this middle one also. And then this dark brown one, it may or may not work. It sort of depends on the color it buffs out to. It does look like it buffs out to kind of a warm tone, which might not be my favorite, rather than a rosy tone, I mean. Those are the two darker ones. So let's try this light one. As a blush, to be clear, I, I'm trying to use this. I'm intrigued by this palette because of the possibility that I might be able to wear these brown creams from e.l.f. as blush. I'm not out here with much of an interest in cream contour is what I'm trying to say. And isn't blush kind of a contour in its own way? Isn't it all contour, blontour, bronzing? It's all the same to me. I mean, it's not not a blush. I'm piling on kind of a lot to see if it starts to look like dirt because I feel like that's the risk you run when you're blushing with a contour product. And I'm putting it on my eyelids too. Well, I don't feel like it looks like dirt. I gotta clean up around it. I don't feel like it looks like dirt, but it's not a super cool toned contour palette. You know, if anything, it looks a little orange, like it's running a little peach on me. One thing it is that's interesting is very matte. It doesn't have any of that like gloss that cream blushes often have, you know, even if they don't have any sparkle in them, which doesn't surprise me because a contour palette wouldn't. Dare I try one of the darker shades? Oh. Mm, yeah, that looked a little bit like dirt. That was the second darkest shade. What's interesting is there's this pale cream colored one. And I wonder what would happen if I like added that in. It's like a mix in that lightens the color. It's almost like a drugstore Salt New York palette with the shade adjuster <laughs> mixed in. Okay, here's how I feel at the moment. It's not untenable, right? It did what I was trying to do. It, it gave me a blush effect. I was able to get a blush effect with it, but I felt like I had to fuss with it. I had to work with it. It didn't apply itself or like make my cheeks look instantly beautiful. I had to fuss with it to keep it from being a little bit patchy or spotty. Not as though it lends itself to patchiness or runs patchy. It's just to get it to apply smoothly over the contours of like my cheek and eye area there. I felt like I had to work at it. I had to work harder than I like to work. I like a cream blush to be effortless because it's such a wonderful part of makeup, such a beautiful part and such an enjoyable part. And when I feel like a formula is causing me to have to like work with it in a certain way or else I'm like risking it looking bad, there's just too many good cream blushes out there for me to be dealing with that. But the thing that I don't know is I don't know if me feeling like I was kind of fighting with a formula I don't know if that's a result of the formula or if that's because I was trying to make these products do something that's not what they're designed to do because this is a cream contour palette and I'm using it as blush. So I don't know that much about cream contouring. I mean, I'm not that familiar with it. And it might be that these are perfectly designed to be cream contours. And then if I'd used them in that way, I would have been like, oh, the formula is fantastic. And it's just trying to make them be blushes. I felt like I was fighting with the formula a little bit. That could be the case. But it also could be the case that the formula is like a little bit stiff, a little bit difficult to get even, doesn't blend itself out, and that that would be true whether they were being used as blushes or cream contours or whatever. Needless to say, the main piece of information that I was after was, are these the same formula as the e.l.f. Active Lip and Cheek? And I don't think they are. They're less emollient. They certainly have less sort of blendability and gloss to them. They're harder to work with. It's just not. I was hoping that I would have like three beautiful brown e.l.f. Active Lip and Cheek blushes, but I don't. It's just a little bit something else. So I'm not wowed by it. I'm not in love with it. Not the best, most perfectly applied blush look ever, but it'll do. It'll do for today. Okay, the creme de la creme. And it's a little awkward, actually, because it's two lipsticks, so I just have to do them one after another. But I just couldn't. I couldn't leave one of them at the store. I'm so intrigued by both of them. First of all, L'Oreal Color Riche Lipstick in Le Beige. This might even have been a suggestion in the comments on that video about God Gone grage. It's not grage enough to dupe Gone Grage. I actually don't even think it's cool toned enough to dupe a Royal Scandal, my favorite Gucci lipstick, but depending on how it applies, I feel like it could have something a little bit in common with like Merit Tiger or the old Raw Chocolate, that Maybelline lipstick I had for such a long time. Ooh. 
it's less orangey. It's less warm toned than I worried that it would be. It's got a little bit of like raisin in it almost. That is a very pretty color and it feels nice and smooth. But I think I need to try this one first. This is a Revlon Super Lustrous Lipstick, such a good formula. And when I saw this color <laughs> in the display, I was just like, oh, I have to try that. <laughs> you already know, I was like, I have to put that on. It's not just pale, but it, it's sort of gray. You know what I mean? Like it has this kind of gray pink thing going on. It's called Skyline Pink. Oh, it's really sheer, but actually I kind of like that these days. It's the pearl, it's a super lustrous pearl formula, which I've actually never tried. I've only ever tried the mattes. I'm gonna put this on. Okay, I really want to love this. I can't tell right away if it's working or if it's not. I think on a lot of people, on most people, on the vast majority of people, this is nothing except that like Paris Hilton, early 2000s, almost white frosted pink lip that's not too pink, right? It's that look exactly, that kind of vintage, at this point, vintage look. I feel like there's maybe a chance that on me, because the rest of me is so pale, it's not quite that, and it's actually maybe close to giving me that very, very, very nude lip look that I love so much, where your lips are basically the same color as the rest of your skin. I feel like it's just a question of how frosty it is, you know? It's on the edge of being too frosty, even for that for me. Maybe blotted? <sighs> I mean, it, it would function for me basically as a lip balm because the super lustrous lipstick formula is really easy to apply, really nourishing. I've loved it ever since I first tried it years ago. Blotted like that, I feel like it's not running the risk of being frosty Paris Hilton lips, but rather just a very, very pale, slightly desaturated pink that is a good color for me, washes my lips out a little bit, you know, while also adding a little tinge of that pink. And I like it. It's hard for me to get my lips to look like this, to look this color. It sort of is that Chantecai lip crystal vibes. This is like the drugstore dupe for that Chantecai lip crystal. It doesn't have gold glitter in it though. I think that it's the gold shimmer in the Chantecai one that keeps it from looking frosty. This is definitely a finer milled shine particle, you know, and it's also more on the gray silver side, so it's going a little frosty. But it's definitely the closest thing in my collection to this, that Chantecai lip crystal, and I love that. Again, because it's hard for me to get my lips to look like this. What do you guys think? When you look at me, are you like, what is this 2001? Where are we in middle school? Or when you look at me, are you like, that's very flattering, love it so much. You have to tell me. It also just feels good. I don't wanna take it off, but I am gonna take it off to put on the other one. Okay, here we go. L'Oreal Color Riche Lipstick in Le Beige. Okay, this is a great lipstick. This is a drugstore find. What looked quite brown and almost like, could be like an orangey leaning brown, in the tube has turned out to be actually something that I understand why they're calling it Le Beige because it's actually mauve undertone. It's like a brown mauve. And it's not a super pale color. If I were to build it up to full opacity, it would be vampy on me, which is nice because that makes it versatile for a lot of skin tones, I think. But the thing that makes it versatile in the direction of my paleness is that while the pigment is there, it's balmy. It's a little bit balmy. It's kind of like the Merit. It didn't apply straight out of the bullet as wetly as sort of slickly pigmented as I was expecting it to. It applied a little bit more chapsticky, which is that quality that I love in the Merit lipstick. I've never tried a L'Oreal Color Reach lipstick, as you can tell by the fact that I'm describing the formula with wonder. The smell, I could imagine being contentious. It's that smell that I somehow associate with diapers, not dirty diapers, but like baby powder or something. But I also feel like it's a little bit floral in an old school way. Like maybe it's a little bit adjacent to like the violet scent that's in the Gucci lipsticks. I don't love it, but I also respect it. <laughs> like there's, it's okay with me. I could see it not working for some people. This color, it's way more wearable because of the formula than I expected it to be. And that's what I'm always saying about the Merit lipsticks. And also because of the formula, it was really easy to get a soft blurred lip line. It was really easy to apply. 
apply. I'm impressed. And I just like the balance of tones and undertones. Like, I like it better on me than Lisa Eldridge Velvet Sorcery. Even, I think, maybe better than Velvet Affair. I feel like it's sophisticated. I feel like the color is sophisticated. And the fact that it's grounded in mauve instead of in, like, red or orange, it's making it, for me, a very wearable brown. Wow, I wasn't expecting that at all. I wasn't expecting to be so favorably impressed by it. I was expecting what often happens to happen, which is that the color would look great in the tube, and then on me, it would look orange. But that is, like, the opposite of that is what happened. Wow. Okay, so some hits and misses. The e.l.f. green color corrector. I think it's a hit for e.l.f. I think it's a great drugstore option for green color corrector. I'll probably keep using my favorite, the one from EXA, because it has a slightly more skin nourishing, skin carry quality, whereas this one is just a bit bare bones. But for being that, it's very effective. L'Oreal Voluminous Brown Balm <laughs> Mascara. I am still incredibly intrigued. I mean, time will tell how it wears throughout the day, how it washes. But if it doesn't cause me any trouble in those realms, it's like at the top of my list right now for the mascaras that I want to be wearing. It has a lot of promise. The e.l.f. palette, honestly, kind of a flop for me. And it might be partly just that I've like built it up in my head for so long that I had a long way to fall, right? To find out that it's not what I dreamed that it was. And to be fair, I'm trying to make something that's designed for one purpose do something else. So it was a little bit of a setup in that way too. But you know, the longer I wear it, it's not just the formula. I don't particularly like the color either. I don't really like how orange it went on me. I probably won't continue to use this. I might mess with it a couple more times just to make sure that I've really tested it thoroughly. But so far, I think this is the biggest disappointment. Revlon Super Lustrous Pearl Lipstick in the shade Skyline Pink. You tell me. I want lots of people to be like you didn't look like Paris Hilton from the 90s so that I can continue to wear it with abandon and without feeling self-conscious about that. And, you know, maybe you guys will be like, you did look like Paris Hilton in the, in the 90s, but we're into it. Like, I guess that that would also be acceptable. This, though, the jury is still out. I want to want it. I still feel really intrigued by it. I will continue to test it. And L'Oreal Color Riche Lipstick in 106 Le Beige. Unexpected smash hit of the video. This feels, and I think looks, very high-end. Like, this feels like a dupe for a high-end lipstick. It reminds me of my favorite, the Merit. The color even reminds me of the sophistication of some of those really intriguing, sought-after brands that are currently kind of at the top of the top in makeup. Can't wait to wear this and wear it and wear it some more. A gem. I've had a comment that I wish I had taken a screenshot of so that I could actually cite it right now or even read it. I can't find it. It's lost to the annals of YouTube, but I remember what it said. It was a comment from one of you saying that you'd like to see me go on a search for weird, muted, mucky, mixed, subtle, grayed out tertiary colors at the drugstore. Editorial colors. That's not exactly what you said in the comment. That's not word for word. But the situation is this. Those are the colors that I prefer. If you've been watching me for a while and you've seen me talk about especially lip colors and cheek colors, but also eye makeup and also clothes. If you've seen me talk about color at all, then you know that I have a preference for colors that are somewhat off the beaten path. Grungy is probably the most mainstream term for the kind of colors that I'm into in makeup. So this comment was saying, Hannah, why don't you go on a hunt at the drugstore for these kinds of colors and see what you can find? And I love that idea and that's what I did. So I have the results of my expedition here. I haven't opened any of them. I'm going to be discovering with you if they read at all on the lips as they looked in the tubes and some of them in the online swatches because, you know, I was there in Ulta like on my phone, making sure that they were at least weird adjacent. It's sometimes hard to tell when you're like looking through the plastic or the cardboard. We're going to find out together. I'm going to be swatching them all on my lips. This is like lip swatch party and we'll see if any of them satisfy. First up, this Juvia's Place glass lip gloss in the shade Flower Girl. I haven't even opened this. I looked up some swatches and they had a little illustration on the display. This is not at all what I thought that it would be. I was under the impression that this was like kind of a grungy gray violet. That's the color that all of the model's lips looked in all of the pictures that I saw. And it's actually transparent right out of the 
gate kind of failing right out of the gate. I'll still put it on, but it's hard to imagine it's gonna be grungy based on this. So I thought it was gonna be like a purplish taupe based on the imagery. It is clear blue with a violet flip and it smells like cotton candy. This isn't at all what I thought I was gonna be getting into. So you could kind of make a case that this is like grungy for a really, really sheer lip color. Like it has given a slight, ever so slight, murky, taupey cast to my lips because it's purple and blue, but it's much less intense than it looked in the imagery. Like I feel like the imagery was enhanced in order to try to give like a really clear sense of what this is, but I wouldn't necessarily call this a grungy gloss. You know, it's not super pink. It It's muted compared to a lot of lip glosses with color in them. And again, on the very transparent, the very clear side of the spectrum of grunge, maybe. So maybe it's good to have something like this, like this subtle in the mix. But for me, it's not enough, right? Like this is not quite what I was going for. The gloss itself is nice. I wish it weren't so sweet, like so cotton candy scented, but now that I have it on, it's not sticking itself in my nose too much. It feels nourishing. It almost feels a little bit plumping. Maybe that's just because my lips were super dry and they're really happy to have something on them. And it has that slick, thick, kind of jelly-like finish that some glosses have these days that I actually quite like. Okay, next up is a gloss from Essence. A couple of you mentioned Essence in the comments on those drugstore videos as a brand I think that makes good glosses. I actually, I don't know if this is the exact one, but I picked this one because of the color. The Essence Extreme Care Hydrating Glossy Lip Balm. It looks like it has maybe a little more opacity than some glosses, you know? It's in shade 03, Milky Cocoa. Oh my gosh. Milky Cocoa, where have you been all my life? It's kind of a weird smell, almost like a spice or something. What a color. What a color. I feel like if I came out with my own makeup, I would put this color in it. Because it's super pale, very neutral, doesn't lean orange. If anything, maybe it leans like, on me it's leaning like a tiny bit pink, but I don't think that's because it has pink in it. I think it's just so neutral. And you know, it's a cream finish, but it's sheer enough or it's sort of melting down to being something sheer enough that it's not causing like lines of really super pale pigment to gather in my lip lines. Or maybe it's just not so pale that it is doing that. It has a nice kind of milkiness, but without, it seems, the problems that that milkiness sometimes causes in glosses. The only thing about it is the weird smell. I wonder if maybe they're trying to do some kind of spiced cocoa thing. It could also be just that my senses are heightened right now, like my sense of smell and taste is not super reliable at this very moment in time. So I'm definitely gonna keep this in the mix and keep trying this. This is exactly the kind of thing that I was hoping to come across on this search. And I don't think I own anything like this, any glosses with color like this. I'm just so impressed by what a pale color it is, what a true brown it is, how easy it is for me to wear. It's kind of a unicorn, wow. Not sticky at all either. Like it's not leaving behind anything really difficult to scrub away as I remove it, which actually might be an issue for longevity. Obviously that's not something I can test today, but I'll come back and let you know. All right, up next, another gloss from Juvia's Place. So Flower Girl, <laughs> this one that ended up just being blue, it was in a box there. Maybe I should have opened the box and just taken a peek, but I didn't. I looked at the imagery, I looked at the online imagery and I was fairly sure it was like a purplish taupe and it's not. This though wasn't in a box, it was like this, just with a little bit of a wrapper on it. So I'm able to see through the plastic of the tube that it actually is a taupe color. It is from the Juvia's Place Coffee Shop collection and it's in the shade Brown Sugar. Ooh, that looks promisingly kind of gray, kind of green. Green gray? No, that's what I've always wanted. Like a greenish gray taupe gloss. Oh, 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 this is different from the other gloss. It's really thin. Hmm, hmm like a glaze. Oh my gosh, I really like the formula. So darker than the Essence gloss, clearly. Thin, really, really thin. Again, kind of like a glaze, but with enough body to be there, especially when layered. Nothing like the other Juvia's Place gloss. So the Flower Girl gloss is marketed as the glass lip gloss. It's like that thick jelly-like thing. This is, it just says the coffee shop lip gloss, but I'm finding the formula way more elevated. Like this feels 
feels really high end to me. This feels like something that a brand like Merit or Make Beauty would come out with formula wise and color wise too. I mean, I did have to scour the drugstore. Okay, I was in there for a long time. It seems like we're having hit after hit. I mean, with the exception of the first one. Okay, so there's just been two. It seems like these last two have just been shockingly successful, but it did take work, y'all. This reminds me of a slightly more pigmented version of the Merit lip oil. Actually, it kind of reminds me of that formula wise as well. Maybe a little bit beefier, but just in, in the, like the thinness and the fact that it's like totally non-sticky. I feel like they could get away with marketing this as something like a pigmented lip oil because it feels that far from what we mostly call a gloss. Oh my gosh, I think this is my favorite of the three so far. I wish it didn't, again, I wish it didn't smell like coffee. It might bother me less at a time when my sense of smell isn't going haywire. And also now that it's on there, it's not as bad. It's just not my super favorite, like coffee scented makeup products. But I feel kind of willing to put up with it for the color and the formula. Whereas with the essence, oh, that's that blotted. Oh my gosh, doesn't this feel like the sibling of A Royal Scandal, Merit 1990, those lip colors that I really love? I mean, as coffee scents go, it's a, a really lovely one. It's There's nothing abhorrent about it. There was something to me a little weird about the essence one. So I feel like between the two of them, this is the one that would be the most likely to you know, wear and wear and wear. Okay, the fourth product that I have is not a gloss. It's not a bullet lipstick either. It's kind of like the bridging product. And it is something that I've owned before, way back in the day. If you're an OG, if you've been here forever, you will remember me loving the shade London from NYX. I had the soft matte lip cream, which is what this is, an iconic old NYX product. And I also had the lip liner. And I think the lip liner was out of stock when I was there at Ulta. I, otherwise, I would have actually gotten it and like done the whole thing. I think I remember the liner being even a little bit weirder than the cream, having like maybe even more of a yellow tinge. And at the time, which was before I really understood my undertone, before I really understood fully what I was looking for in terms of lip color, I already understood that I struggled to find nude lips that had that je ne sais quoi on me, that sort of muted quality on me. They would always be brights instead of muted, even if they looked muted on other people. And at the time, NYX London was one of the only ones, if not the only one that I felt like was sort of approaching that. So I'm curious to know if I still feel that it is that way or what. I actually wonder if maybe it's going to be much more orange than what I prefer now, but I just don't really know. Let's take a look at it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That looks really, really, really orange. Orangey peach to me. I like the formula. I remember eventually becoming unimpressed with the longevity of this formula. It just wears away really quickly. And that was why I eventually decluttered this product, even though I actually had it for quite a long time and I wore it a lot and I wore it in a lot of videos back in the day. But from where I'm sitting now with what I know now about color, with the lip products that I've acquired since then, what I've come to really love, this to me, it's a shade of peach. Back then, I was much more interested in wearing peach. I, I was more comfortable with it. I felt like peach was a color that was good for me. I think as I've aged and it's been, you know, five or six years, it's it's been what it is, is like the difference between my late 20s, early 30s and my late 30s, you know? So as I've aged over these years and I've moved into my late 30s, I have become less fond of peach for me because I feel like it kind of makes a girl out of me. I just, I don't think it's unflattering. I mean, I think for someone with my coloring, peach isn't a bad choice. It just reminds me of, of my youth and it kind of makes me feel like I'm trying to evoke the makeup looks of a younger version of myself and I've grown away from it for that reason. But I will say is that for a peach, for me, this is a very wearable one. It's like a spiced peach. You know what I mean? It's kind of reading as a spiced peach on me. And a lot of brands that make what they would call a spiced peach on me, it just looks like a bright peach. So that would be great if I was looking for a spiced peach, but I'm just not looking for that anymore. And I think that if I didn't know about this already, I wouldn't have picked it on this trawl through Ulta. I wouldn't have looked at it and thought, oh, that looks like it could be a grungy option for a lip color at the drugstore. I just pulled it for old times sake to see how my reaction to the color has maybe changed. And yeah, it's amazing to me that at the time, this was an extremely unusual, like off color in my lip collection. And now to me, it's a very straight down the middle kind of color. Okay, we're moving into the wilds of the bullet lipsticks. 
I think I kind of have high hopes for some of these. First up is another one from Essence. So I was looking down the Essence display and I looked down at where the lipsticks were and it has like the little color chip in the front of every row. And one of them just screamed at me, like this might be what you're looking for. They all just looked normal, like pink, and then this one looked grungy. But you know, you can't tell anything from those little color swatches. So we'll see. Here's a lipstick. It's in the shade Legendary. And that looks kind of like what the color swatch looked like in the store. Hmm, but the lipstick itself looks a lot more orange than that. I mean, that looks like it has some purple in it, like almost a grayish. And the lipstick looks like more of a straight, hmm. It feels amazing. It feels like chocolate, melting chocolate, creamy. Formula feels amazing. It smells like very faintly of sort of like a spiced chocolate, a much more pleasant smell than the gloss had. Like vanilla chai cookies or something. Okay, the color has impressed me for a drugstore lipstick, for a drugstore nude. It has impressed me, but it hasn't quite rung my bell. You know what I mean? I have a Royal Scandal by Gucci in my makeup drawer. I have Merit 1990, Maybelline Congrave, and this is just, again, a little bit closer to center than any of those and has a drop more maybe orange than I would like it to have for it to really read as grungy on me. But it is a very beautiful rose. It's not too dark, especially blotted. It feels like it might be a dupe for a Lisa Eldridge color that I'm just not quite sure. And I don't have my other lipsticks down here to do any comparisons. There are so many of these getting through all eight of them that I felt like it would be chaos if I tried to do that. But it kind of reminds me of Velvet. Velvet Sorcery and Velvet Affair, like the most recent Lisa Eldridge lipstick acquisitions of mine. And it's really wearable. And again, I quite like the formula. So definitely not a miss as a lipstick, but I'm not as excited about it color-wise as I was about the Essence Gloss or the Juvia's Place Gloss. So grungier than some, a decent option for someone at the drugstore who is looking for what I'm looking for, but like a mild version of that, you know? Okay, next up, this may be the one that I had the lowest hopes about because I couldn't find the display. It was just stuck in with some other lipsticks from a different display. I don't even think they had the display. And I just, I kept looking through this plastic at the color and that's basically what I was able to see. And doesn't it look a little bit like an icy sort of pinky grayish? It's the Ultimate Lip Suede from Revlon and it's in the shade Influencer, which also kind of cracks me up clicks up and down. That's weird. And when I looked it up, it looked like it might be sort of like an off pink with like a little bit of a weird gray iciness to it. And it looked pale. There's on my bottom lip and not my top. Surprisingly, my lips put better on me. No smell, which is kind of nice right now. Okay, it's pink. It's really in some ways just a straight pink, but it's a very wearable pink because it is in a vacuum mixed with some slightly off tones. If it weren't, it would be really garish pink on me. And in fact, it's sort of soft soft in its own way on me. It's working and I feel like that means that compared to other pinks, it's on the light side and it's on the extremely neutral side. Just not quite weird enough, again, to make me lose my mind over it, but I can see why it ended up in this pile, you know? Let's blot it. I'm also not mad at the formula. It's interesting. It feels a little bit like a slightly more pigmented version of the NARS Afterglow lip balm that I've been really into. It felt super easy to just slather it on, quite melty, but it's not too shiny. I mean, it says ultimate suede. It's just, it's not super matte, but I think it's supposed to be, I would guess, I mean, I don't know anything about this product, but I would guess that it's supposed to be a balmy, nourishing thing that leans matte rather than glossy, which is nice. And yeah, it's brighter than I would prefer. I'm not going to be like reaching for this over and over again. If someone wants it, like a friend who comes to my house, I'll probably just give it away because pink like this, even a pink that's really Really wearable on me isn't my favorite thing to wear. But again, the fact that it is wearable in this way, it's almost like reminds me a little bit of Merit Baby in terms of how wearable it is for me, how much it's suiting me as a pink. I don't love it or even really like it, but it could be worse. The color, I mean. The formula might be my favorite one of all of the ones I've tried so far, partly because it doesn't have a scent. The Juvia's Place Gloss, the coffee gloss, absent the scent is my favorite formula that I've tried so far. This felt really innovative to me, really, really cool. But just for a bullet product, the formula is very impressive. But the color, I don't really love or like. 
Okay, this one too feels like it could be a bit of a wild card. It's definitely the darkest. Yeah, the most like some sort of red or mauve of anything else. The packaging really intrigues me too. It might be one of the reasons I ended up choosing it. Oh, and the color. <laughs> the color is called Le Wood Nonchalant. Le Wood Nonchalant. The Nonchalant Forest. It's a L'Oreal Color Riche lipstick. It reminds me of YSL packaging. And you can see why I picked the color, right? It's like a brownish mauve. It smells a little bit fruity but not in a repellent way. In actually a little bit of a high-end way. Look at the embossing too and the shape of the tip. It's kind of nice. They were going for something and they kind of got there. Let's see how it looks. This is also screaming Lisa Eldridge colors. It's really matte. Okay, I have a lot to say about this. First of all, the scent and I guess a little bit flavor, it's very impressive. It smells like a Joe Malone Cassis scent to me. Like it, it really smells like high-end fragrance that is blackberry based or Cassis based, like blackberry syrup. I really am finding it unexpected to come across a scent like this in a lip product at the drugstore. So there's that. It's really matte. It uh, gave me that super blended, soft stained popsicle lip. I blurred the lip line a lot with a brush, but there's just something about the intense pigment of it, the matte quality of it. Also probably the fact that it's like the seventh lip product in a row that I've tried on. It reminds me so much of the Lisa Eldridge Velvet formula. It reminds reminds me specifically of Velvet Sorcery, which I can't compare it to even if I had everything down here because I decluttered Velvet Sorcery because it was so hard to apply it without it going patchy. And it's interesting, this, I wouldn't say exactly that it's going patchy. In fact, it's not, not in the way that Velvet Sorcery did on me, but there is something about that stainy depth that is reminiscent not just of the color, but like the entire lipstick. It's definitely a burgundy that I would wear, you know? Not as super grungy or super different as I was hoping for in the way that those Lisa Eldridge lipsticks never are. You know what I mean? Like the ones that are marketed as straying really far from the center never actually do. They always are just still pretty normal colors. Like she has yet to release something that's truly different. And this isn't that different to me. It's just like a vampy lip, but it's a vampy lip that is grounded enough in, again, neutral tones, grungy undertones, browns, enough for me to actually wear it and feel good in it. So that is, that's yeah, cool. Again, not a smash absolute blow your mind hit, but not a miss. I should have saved it for last though. It's gonna be coming off okay. Okay, last but hopefully not least, one that I actually do have high hopes for. So I came across this just as I was checking out. I was about to leave Ulta and I realized I hadn't looked at the Ulta brand lipsticks yet. So I took a look at the Ulta brand lipsticks display and I saw this lip color, Dusty Mauve. The packaging is not bad either. It's like kind of weighty. Look at that. Uh, Dusty Mauve if I ever saw one. Where was this in my video about trying to dupe Gone Grage? This formula also feels nice. Ah, oh, it's not too pigmented. I kind of like that. Okay, yeah. This is an actual grungy color. This is a good color. Y'all, the find of the video. Here, right at the very end, the find of the video. So it's not scented. It has that kind of the smell of a cream lipstick, you know? But not even, but it's not strong. I mean, if you really, really smell it close up, you're like, oh, that's makeup. But it doesn't smell like chemicals, and it's also not scented. It's lovely and creamy and nourishing to the lips, but it's not not intensely opaque. It's not as much of that hybrid sort of chapsticky formula as the Merit lipstick, which is like my holy grail formula, my favorite to which all others are compared. It's not quite that level of sheer, but this is a full two coats. You know, like I layered it on, I layered it again. It's really thick, full opacity and blotted down to one. I don't know. I mean, that is acting kind of like the Merit formula. And the first swipe was a little bit semi-sheer. I'm so excited about this. Yeah, it's, it's nice. You know, it's not doing that thing where it's like melting and getting super pigmented and getting all over the place. It's like keeping itself together, which is what we require for lipstick these days. So the formula is unexpectedly great. This is just the Ulta lipstick, but the color, the color, I mean, that is a wearable grungy nude if I ever saw one. Maybe kind of close to Gone Grage. My guess is that it's a little bit more on the mauve side, like a cross between Gone Grage and My Lips But Better. I love it. I feel like this is going to go straight into my drawer and straight into rotation. I feel like this is the win, the number one crowning win. It makes me realize that one of the things that I feel like was tough about this one, the second to last one, L'Oreal Color Riche in Le Wood Nonchalant, is that it was just so pigmented. 
pigmented. Really, really intensely pigmented and rich and dark in color for me. So beautiful, grungy in its way, but just so much less effortlessly wearable. This is like an effortlessly wearable grungy nude. I can't believe it. Slay, Ulta, slay. <laughs> like, welcome to how I'm going to look in every video over the next two weeks, at least lips wise. It's going to be tough not to wear this. I'm really here for it. it. It feels like it has a little bit of that purple in it, which is the thing that it was so hard to find when I was trying to do Gone Grage. Maybe Ulta saw that video and created this lipstick just for me. Okay, let's recap. Let's rank. I'm going to rank, I think, my from top to bottom. And what I'm ranking them in terms of is my excitement to wear them. Number one, I would totally wear this. Like, this is. It's like my new favorite lipstick. I would 1000% totally wear this. I wish Merit had a color like this. This is weirder and grungier than anything Merit does have. And in a formula that does a lot of the same things. The thing that I'm the second most excited about is the Juvia's Place Coffee Shop Lip Gloss in Brown Sugar. Again, the scent isn't my absolute favorite, but it's preferable to a lot of the other things I smelled today. And it's just, it's the fact that it's this really thin, non-sticky, nourishing oil gloss type of feel. And the fact that the brown, it seems like it has maybe a little bit of green mixed in, like something to keep it super neutral. I loved the way that this felt and the way that it looked. And this too, I can't wait to wear again. My third favorite is probably the Essence Gloss. Again, because this color and opacity of color, but still wearability, is so difficult to find. I'm gonna have to do some reading about the scent to understand what they were trying to do and try to get past it. Might actually be a deal breaker, but again, I'm leaving that aside for now. And that aside, this was an amazing, amazing color. And the formula was lovely and it felt good on the lips and everything. So that's probably number three. Number four, I think is gonna go to the Essence Lipstick, which was a little bit grungier, a little bit less orange. It's not orange by any means, but you know. A wearable middle of the road, not, not grungy neutral, but all things considered, I would rather wear something like one of my Merit lips or my Gucci lips than this. The formula is also really good. I didn't fall in love with it, but I don't have any complaints about it. After that, I'm gonna give it to Le Wood Nonchalant, the L'Oreal Color Riche Super Matte, absolutely a dupe for YSL. I mean, that has to be what this is. It has to be a dupe for that YSL matte lip color that came out pretty recently and a really successful dupe of that. In fact, even though I tend to like colors like this more than colors like this, I'm actually going to put this in front of the, the essence because this, the execution of it intrigues me so much. The scent, the formula, the packaging, the name. Like I, I actually am kind of into this, even though it was a lot on me today. Actually, I'm actually going to bump the essence gloss because of the scent issue and put this ahead of it. The more I think about it, the more impressed I am by this. And I'm kind of curious about what the other colors are. I'm going to look this up. I was just like grabbing stuff at the drugstore. I don't know from the stuff. So I'm going to look this up and find out more about it. Yeah, it felt very high end. And to me, that unseats even the really amazing color of this because the weird scent of this made it feel very, like, gross. Like the side of drugstore makeup that makes me shy away sometimes from drugstore makeup. Whereas this is, like, conspicuously missing that side. I mean, this is just, like, you could tell me this is $45. I would believe you. I would believe you this is $45. So in spite of the fact that the the color was my absolute favorite. This is in third place now, the L'Oreal. Essence Extreme Care is in fourth place. If you know anything about the scent of that, let me know. Essence Legendary Semi Matte Lipstick is in fifth place. I guess that the other Juvia's Place gloss is in sixth place just because it is like a slightly taupey purple version of a super sheer gloss. And that's something that I would be more likely to wear than a pink and a peach. And that's what's left, right? Actually, no. Revlon Color Stay is in sixth place because it was a wearable pink for me, and sometimes I will wear a wearable pink, and the formula really impressed me. This is, I, again, I'm, I'm kind of going to look this up and see what el other colors it comes in. This was the only color they had at the Ulta when I was there. The Revlon Color Stay Ultimate Suede. Yeah, it was so wearable, easy to apply, nourishing, impressive. So it's in sixth place. Weird blue Juvia's Place gloss in seventh place. <laughs> and poor NYX London. My old favorite is in eighth place. Put it on for this video. Never going to wear it again. Wow. Wild. 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 Some real hits, some intriguing things in the middle ground, and some misses. We love a dynamic video. The top two are the two big hits. The Juvia's Place Coffee Gloss, which comes in a whole bunch of other shades of brown, by the way. This is just the one that I thought would suit me the best. But if you're not quite looking for what I'm looking for in undertones, but you are interested in a brown gloss, formula is fantastic. And then the winningest one, happily, is the one in which I'm ending the video. And I'm just going to go wear it around for the rest of the day. Thank you so much for watching this. And you know what I'm going to say. 
say. If you know of any grungy lip colors at the drugstore that I didn't happen to stumble across at my rounds at Ulta, let me know what they are. And if there are enough of them and they all look likely enough, I'll do it again. I mean, you know what I like now, right? You know what I like? Lay it on me. Let's build a longer list of this kind of thing. Thank you to whoever it was who originally made this suggestion. I'm sorry that I didn't screenshot your comment and I don't remember what you said exactly or who you are, but I'm so appreciative and curious to know if this even can be done with blushes, for example. I feel like lips have the widest range, so I was able to find eight to go on. It might be harder to do with something like blush, but if it can be done, I will do it. Thank you to all of you commenters and those of you who are subscribed to my channel. I really appreciate you and everybody watching. I hope that you are remembering to take extra good care of yourself so that you can be the most effective version of yourself as you do your work in the world.